Never in my wildest dreams did I think that late September back in 1995 would take such a horrifying turn. I was just an average guy, a truck driver named Dave. My life was simple, consisting of long drives across the United States and casual stops at diners to humor my chat cravings. One day, after completing a long haul from Illinois to Arkansas, I decided to sketch out my route for the next day. Going over my maps at a well-known truck stop, I could hear the dull buzz of conversations around me. My ears tuned into a couple of truckers nearby discussing a recent string of eerie occurrences along a stretch of highway I was due to drive through tomorrow. Their terrifying stories sent chills down their spines as they detailed gruesome accidents and hushed rumors about someone or something lurking behind these horrors. Dave? Is that you? A familiar voice interrupted the chilling conversation. It turned out that my old buddy, Mark, happened to be there as well. We caught up over some terrible diner coffee, reminiscing about our shared driving experiences. Suddenly, Mark flashed an uneasy smile and revealed how relieved he was to be off that godforsaken stretch of highway where all those nasty things had taken place. As soon as he mentioned it, curiosity got the better of me. What's up with that place? Mark leaned in closer and whispered a vivid account he had heard from another trucker. A man had been run off the road by an unknown force. His truck was found abandoned on the side of the highway, its doors wide open and blood smeared on the hood. The driver was never seen again. I decided to brush it off as trucker gossip, but later that night... When I settled into bed in the cab of my truck, I couldn't shake off those words. Regardless, sleep eventually claimed me. The next day began like any other, heading off on the route I had been charting. I passed through several small towns, and before I knew it, I was driving down the dreaded highway Mark had warned me about. There were no signs of anything out of the ordinary. It was just a typical, uneventful drive. That is, until I spotted a lone car, with the semblance of some road debris scattered around it, slowly creeping along the side of the road. It had all the makings of someone who needed help, possibly due to a car accident. Unable to ignore someone in potential distress, I pulled over and approached while noticing that the dented car appeared as if it had been in a major collision. The driver was an older man, shaking and covered in scratches and bruises. He seemed disoriented as he mumbled about somebody or something following him. Suddenly, another vehicle raced into view from behind us before coming to a screeching halt alongside mine. A rugged-looking man stepped out with a chilling grin. The older man's eyes widened in terror as he rushed into his car and sped off. "'What's going on?' I asked, adrenaline coursing through me as I tried to make sense of the situation. "'All good,' he replied calmly. "'Just some old fool telling tales about imaginary monsters.' Before I could ask any more questions... My CB radio crackled to life, a distress call from another trucker nearby frantically warning about an attack on his truck. Vicious sounds could be heard in the background. The rugged man smirked maliciously and climbed back into his vehicle without another word, quickly vanishing down the highway that had become infamous overnight. I raced back to my truck my instincts screaming at me that something seriously sinister was afoot here. I fired up my engine and was about to call for help over the CB radio when I hesitated. The trucker who had called for help earlier had been cut off mid-sentence, and something inside me warned against attempting to call for help through the same channel. I figured it was safer not to risk getting noticed by whoever, or whatever, 
was causing all this trouble. Instead, I decided to drive along the highway, keeping a watchful eye on any bizarre activity, hoping that an opportunity would present itself for me to intervene without putting myself in harm's way or drawing any unwanted attention. Over the next few days, truck drivers and motorists alike continued to share their horror stories regarding terrifying experiences on that stretch of road. Most unsettling of all were the increasingly gruesome accidents that were claimed to have happened. A trail of blood seemed to extend from one end of the highway to the other. Unnerved but determined to put an end to this reign of terror, I decided to covertly follow the rugged man with the chilling grin who seemed to be at the heart of it all. What I unearthed was a series of gruesome events, drivers taken captive only to be tortured and killed in agonizing ways, their faces locked in eternal expressions of unspeakable horror. Throughout my observation, I never saw his full features clearly enough or heard his name mentioned by anyone around him. But he always seemed ever-present around these horrific incidents, an imposing figure with a malicious grin. As my investigation continued, I found myself talking with other truck drivers who bore witness to these terrible occurrences. They described how victims had been maimed and mutilated beyond recognition. The description sent shivers down our spines as we whispered them between mouthfuls of lukewarm coffee at various truck stops dotted along the highway. Unable to summon help without putting more lives at risk and knowing time was a factor before more victims perished, I set my plan into motion. Based on patterns I had noticed in his movements, I waited by the side of the road, ready to intercept him at his next gruesome act. My heart raced as his vehicle approached, kicking up clouds of dust in its wake. I confronted him just as he began a macabre ritual with his latest unsuspecting victim. In the scuffle that ensued, I managed to wound the rugged man. However, despite being hurt, he still fled with unnatural speed and agility, disappearing into the night like a phantom. The mysterious antagonist remained elusive. No one seemed to know his true identity or how to bring him to justice. In the aftermath of those frenzy-filled days on that desolate highway, the survivor I saved from the rugged man's clutches mentioned that a name was said by someone ever so faintly during our altercation. Lucas! Could that be the name of this unknown fiend? With stomachs turning from contemplating all we had witnessed, we chose not to call for help. The risk of alerting more drivers and potential victims was too great. So, we let out a heavy sigh and continued our routes, each carrying our own piece of a dark secret. As I cruised along the open road, my mind couldn't help but return to all those who lost their lives at Lucas' twisted hands. Silence became my home between those cold metal walls. And so... That eerie experience from late September back in 1995 lingers as part of a dread-inducing mystery unsolved. Each new generation navigating that stretch of highway does so with an unease that remains firmly rooted in our harrowing past. But the question persists, did wounding Lucas truly stop his grisly acts? Or are there more tortured screams waiting to pierce our eardrums again someday? Only time will tell if that sinister specter will resurface from the darkest shadows of our shared nightmares. I've been a truck driver for as long as I can remember, hauling cargo from coast to coast. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it, right? People often ask me if I've ever encountered anything strange on the road. I usually laugh it off and shrug my shoulders. However, every now and then, there's an exception. 
like this one time back in October 1993. I still can't quite explain what happened that night. I'd picked up a load of refrigerated goods in Salt Lake City, Utah, and was making my way down Interstate 80 towards Cheyenne, Wyoming. As sometimes happens on those long stretches of road, I needed to take a break to stretch my legs and grab something to eat. So, I pulled into a truck stop just outside Evanston. Eddie's Big Rig Emporium, the sign read. It was a pretty typical truck stop, neon lights flickering over the fuel pumps, the smell of diesel mixed with greasy burgers coming from inside the diner, nothing out of the ordinary. As soon as I walked through the door, I could feel that this place had seen better days. Worn-out linoleum floors and cracked vinyl booths lined the walls. A tired-looking waitress greeted me with a small smile as she handed me a menu. "'What can I get you?' she asked wearily. "'I'll take the burger special with fries and coffee,' I responded. Then suddenly my cell phone rang. It was good old Uncle Sam calling about taxes." Another thing that comes with being a truck driver. As I focused on my phone conversation about deductions and expenses while sipping my lukewarm cup of coffee, I hadn't noticed a man seated two booths away from me at first. The waitress seemed more than eager to attend to his requests, refill after refill on his coffee, following meticulous instructions on how he wanted his food cooked. He wasn't big or burly, just an average-looking guy in his early forties, clean-shaven and wearing a red flannel shirt. But despite the apparent normalcy of this patron, there was just something off about him. His eyes looked cold and calculated, as if each move he made was part of a sinister plan that only he knew the outcome of. My phone call ended abruptly with me having to answer some more questions tomorrow. My burger had arrived at the same time I hung up. Engaging in some harmless chatter with the waitress to help bide the time, I subtly inquired whether she recognized the man from previous visits. She hadn't seen him before but confirmed he'd been there for a while with no sign of leaving soon. As I devoured my burger and fries, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that crawled down my spine whenever I glanced his way. I tried to brush it off and attribute it to watching too many true crime documentaries. Ready to hit the road again, I paid my bill and left a generous tip for the waitress, mostly out of guilt for dragging her into my strange paranoia about this ordinary man. She thanked me profusely as I walked out into the chilly autumn air that had swept through Wyoming. I climbed into my truck, started the engine, and began to pull out of Eddie's when, to my absolute shock, the truck violently jolted forward from an unmistakable impact. My heart raced as I struggled to comprehend what had happened only seconds ago. And then I saw him, Flannel shirt guy was standing by the back corner of my trailer with a twisted half-grin on his face. He had purposefully slammed his pickup truck into mine. I could see him slowly working his way towards me, brandishing an old-fashioned meat cleaver without any sign of hesitation or emotion. I knew I had to act fast. I floored the accelerator hoping to create some distance from this madman who just made a decision that would drastically alter both our lives. As I sped down the interstate, I kept glancing in my rearview mirror, expecting to see the flannel shirt maniac giving chase. To my surprise, however, he stood there, cleaver in hand, watching me drive away. Despite my escape, I felt no relief. The thought of what had just transpired plagued me for the following miles. I needed to get help, but calling the police didn't feel like the right move. There just didn't seem to be enough evidence to warrant an investigation. 
so instead I turned to fellow truckers. Pulling into a rest area further down the road, I gathered myself and resolved to relay my bizarre encounter to others in hopes that someone might provide some answers or insight. At the rest stop, I approached a group of truckers who were exchanging tales of adventure and excitement. After introducing myself and explaining what had just happened at Eddie's big rig emporium, their faces turned somber. One older trucker finally spoke up, revealing that he recognized the description of the flannel shirt man. The old man explained that this psychopath was notorious among truckers and had been terrorizing isolated areas for years. He'd earned himself a sinister nickname, Cleaver Man, and his criminal reputation was only matched by his elusive nature. Nobody knew his true identity or why he pursued these violent episodes. Following my confession at the rest stop, other truckers corroborated similar stories of their own encounters with Cleaver Man. These horrifying accounts all shared a common theme. Victims were often lured from their trucks by some deceptively benign contrivance, only to be brutally dismembered amidst a bloodbath. Despite this alarming news, we all knew we had a job to do and couldn't let our fears deter us from completing our hauls. Before we parted ways, we exchanged contact information and made a pact to notify each other if Cleaver Man was spotted again, hoping the combined efforts of the trucker community might successfully track him down. With this newfound information and a new network of allies, I continued my journey towards Cheyenne. As the sun dipped below the horizon, its last glimmers cast swaying shadows on the pavement that sent shivers down my spine. I was reminded of Cleaver Man's brutality, but I also felt reassured by the companionship and support of fellow truckers. It wasn't until days later, when I reached my destination, that I finally felt safe enough to take a breather. During this time, more stories circulated among truckers using our communication network about recent sightings of Cleaver Man at other truck stops. I decided to use my short break to compile all incoming reports in hopes of identifying patterns or leads in our collective search for Cleaver Man. It wasn't long before a pattern emerged. Most attacks occurred in remote areas with minimal human presence ideal locations for heinous acts with reduced risk exposure. Despite our common goal of ending Cleaver Man's reign of terror, it seemed as if no attempt would lead us to the vile culprit. It was then that I received an email from an anonymous informant, someone claiming to know the real identity and intentions behind these gruesome attacks. The message went as follows. You seek answers about the man you call Cleaver. He's closer than you think and won't be stopped anytime soon. The mysterious email had no sender name or return email address. Despite knowing it could be a hoax or an instrument to spread fear among us even further, I shared this puzzling message with my fellow truckers on our communication network. While we're yet to uncover his identity or motivations, one thing is clear. This elusive figure known as Cleaver Man remains a menace to us all. Our only recourse is to remain vigilant and cautious as we continue our jobs, each journey burdened by the knowledge of the lurking plight we aim to thwart, all the while seeking solace in those eerie flickering neon lights cast over the lonely interstates. And so I drive on, heart heavy but devoted to my duties as a truck driver and an ally hunting for answers. It was a mid-June afternoon in 1995, hotter than usual for that time of year in Kansas City. I was hauling a load of lumber from a distribution center to a construction site upstate. Back then, 
There were no cell phones or GPS, just the radio waves crackling with country music and the hum of my engine accompanying me on my endless trips. My truck, Bertha, an old but sturdy Peterbilt 379, was my only company and confidant during those long drives on endless stretches of highway. On that particular day, I stopped at Eddie's dinette for a quick bite before setting out again. As I wolfed down my greasy cheeseburger and half-stale fries, I found myself listening to two other guys talking nearby. They were discussing the recent disappearances in the area, people vanishing without any clues. Old Lady Fiddlesticks even claimed she'd seen an odd-looking man near her house late one night. I dismissed their talk as mindless gossip, likely fueled by a desire to escape the monotony of our small-town lives. Years spent on the road had made me resistant to fear or superstition. As night fell and I resumed my journey, thunder roared in the distance. Clouds cloaked the full moon, leaving behind nothing but pitch-black darkness on either side of me. My headlights occasionally exposed stray animals darting off the road or abandoned vehicles consumed by rust and overgrowth. Bertha's wheels continued humming along as I reassured myself that I was prepared for any obstacles Mother Nature had in store. Suddenly, it felt like someone slammed their fist onto Bertha's hood with bone-jarring force. I cursed as she jerked forward violently, sending my head flying into the steering wheel. Swerving to maintain control of that 25-ton behemoth careening down the asphalt proved no easy task. It took all my strength and concentration to counteract the momentum and avoid jackknifing. Finally gaining control, I screeched to a halt on the shoulder of the road. My heart battered the walls of my chest as I squinted into the darkness trying to discern what the hell had just happened. Just then, lightning illuminated the sky with a blinding flash. There, in front of me on the asphalt, lay a gruesome sight. Bits of gore littered the pavement, along with chunks of mangled rope and shredded fabric. My pulse raced furiously while nausea clawed at my throat. What hides underneath must be even worse. My first thought was that I'd hit some animal trying to cross the road, not an uncommon thing for truckers like me. But as I was about to step out into the rain to take a closer look, a cold wave of dread washed over me. The memory of those men at Eddie's dinette discussing vanished people made my skin crawl even more than before. A voice in my head warned me not to get out but curiosity and fear held me in place, struggling against each other for dominance. Just then, nearly drowned out by the booming thunder, I heard it, labored breathing from somewhere nearby. Compelled beyond reason now, I cracked open Bertha's door and peered around cautiously. Despite the darkness and driving rain, I saw him, a man covered in tatters of soaked clothing staggering towards me on legs that looked twisted beyond repair. Our eyes locked for what seemed like an eternity, his gleaming with an unsettling malice that sent chills up and down my spine. As if taunting me with everything yet left unsaid, he reached out his battered hand menacingly. I slammed Bertha's door shut and slammed on the accelerator. The man lunged forward, but Bertha peeled off before he could get any closer. I drove as fast as I could, trying to put as much distance between me and that terrifying figure. But it was difficult in the darkness, with the rain assaulting my windshield relentlessly. My mind raced, and I couldn't shake the image of the battered stranger from my memory. I decided to call for help. Eddie from the diner might know something or at least be able to provide guidance. However, when I picked up the CB radio and attempted to make contact, all I heard was eerie static. 
That voice inside me once again urged caution. I knew seeking help on this desolate road wouldn't be easy. When I finally reached town, I went straight to the sheriff's office. An old friend of mine worked there and agreed to listen to my story. He looked skeptical but told me that they would look into it. Before leaving, he handed me a flyer detailing the missing people in our area. The next day, I cautiously continued with my duties. As I turned a corner onto another long stretch of road, I couldn't believe what lay before me, more scattered bits of gore and remnants of clothing. Apprehension immediately flooded me, but my responsibility to deliver my cargo steeled my resolve. Suddenly, another trucker came on the radio, frantically stating that they had seen a man fitting the description of my harasser attacking someone by the side of the road. Chills took hold of my spine as I realized my encounter wasn't an isolated incident. Determined to find answers, I started piecing together clues between deliveries and visiting people who had witnessed strange occurrences similar to mine. The puzzle began to take shape. Each account shared elements like tattered clothing and twisted limbs. It wasn't long before someone came forth with information about who this man might be, Jasper Clayton, a local recluse known for his violent tendencies. They claimed he was last seen wearing clothing similar to what remained at each crime scene. I didn't know how Jasper could survive such devastating injuries, but the likelihood that our malign monster was a fellow human began to haunt me. As I relayed this information to my friend at the sheriff's office and recounted Jasper's name, he blanched. That can't be possible, he stuttered. Jasper Clayton died two weeks ago, a bad fall in his cabin. We found his mangled body, barely recognizable. Stunned, my mind reeled. Who could the man who attacked me be if not the deceased Jasper? And what about those poor folk who shared my terrifying experience? Sleep evaded me for days after that conversation. I found myself on high alert during every second of my deliveries, more desperate than ever to find answers that eluded me. One fateful night, while driving a lonely stretch by the woods, I caught sight of the twisted man once more. He stood in front of my headlights, unmoving. Despite fear gripping my heart like a vice, I exited Bertha and cautiously approached him. He lifted his head to reveal glassy eyes and bared his teeth in a malicious snarl. I instinctively stepped back but stopped myself as we gazed intently at one another. It had been only moments since I gathered my courage that an unmarked cruiser suddenly pulled up beside us. A deputy quickly emerged from the vehicle, aiming his gun at the stranger. The deformed man finally broke free from our staring contest and hobbled into the woods with astonishing speed. There was no hope of catching up. As he vanished into the darkness, I turned to thank the officer for his timely appearance when a thought struck me. How had he known where to find us? His face paled under the flashlight beam, and the deputy muttered, I'm sorry you had to go through this again. We've been monitoring these woods after recent sightings, waiting for him to show up. I turned toward the woods, feeling an abrupt chill accompanying my newfound realization. This was far from over. The twisted figure remained out there, and his origin and intentions seemed more elusive than ever. As my cargo deliveries continued, I couldn't shake the dread now constantly weighing on me. People across the state continued to vanish, with only gore and speculation for company. We all knew there was something unnatural plaguing our once peaceful lives destined to haunt us in nightmares forevermore.
I remember it like it was yesterday, even though it happened back in 1999. The year has been good for me so far. I was a truck driver, hauling loads across the United States and seeing sights I'd never dreamed of in my sleepy hometown. That June, I was making a run from Atlanta to Memphis, looking forward to catching a blues show once I'd parked the rig for the night. It was around noon when I stopped at a roadside diner just outside of Birmingham, hoping to grab a bite and a coffee before getting back on the road. The place was nothing special, one of those mom and pop joints where the waitresses have that weary air about them, and you can tell they've seen it all. But the food was decent, and the chatter allowed me to shake off a particularly heavy couple of days spent behind the wheel. It was then that the stranger appeared. He walked in right after me, as if he'd been waiting for me to enter first. He wasn't noticeably tall or short and had a distinctly average build. It was his eyes that gave me pause. They were piercingly green like a cat's and seemed unnaturally icy in his otherwise forgettable face. He took the booth behind me and asked for coffee as well. We exchanged polite nods but didn't engage in conversation. Truckers know when another driver needs space. But something about this man kept picking at my subconscious like an insistent itch, making me fidgety with unease as I ate my lunch. When I finally left the diner, he strolled out after me, waving away any offer to settle his bill. He climbed into an old Trans AM idling outside revving its engine loudly before taking off down the road in the opposite direction. A curious feeling crept around the edges of my mind as I slid into my driver's seat, but I couldn't say why. Just another trucker. I tried to tell myself as I climbed back onto the highway, eager to put that odd encounter behind me. As the miles rolled by, I realized that I couldn't shake the memory of that man. It was as though some sinister presence had wrapped itself around me, following my every move. To distract myself, I changed the radio station and chuckled at a corny joke told by the DJ, anything to focus on something other than that ice-cold gaze. But somewhere between Tupelo and Memphis, things took a horrifying turn. The sun had just dipped below the horizon when my rig unexpectedly lost power. With growing panic, I steered onto the side of the road and climbed out into the gathering darkness to check my engine. I was just about to give up, fearing that I'd be stranded there all night, when another vehicle pulled in behind me, the same CD Trans AM from earlier that day. In an instant, Every sense of safety and sanity was swept away, replaced by sheer terror coursing through every nerve in my body. This time, rather than sit down and chat over food at a familiar diner, this man got out of his car brandishing a rusty crowbar with what can only be described as unhinged delight. He approached me slowly, savoring every step closer, like a predator stalking its prey. As he swung his crowbar down towards me with ferocious force, I could feel the weight of every decision I'd ever made slamming into my consciousness. In a desperate attempt to defend myself, I grabbed a tire iron from my truck and dove, narrowly avoiding the swinging crowbar. The force of his swing caused the stranger to stumble a little, giving me enough time to strike back with my makeshift weapon. I hit him hard on his arm, but it barely seemed to slow him down. Instead, he lunged at me again with his crowbar. We continued this dangerous dance, each trying to land a harmful blow on the other. Just as I managed to sidestep another strike from the stranger, I suddenly remembered that I had my mobile phone in the truck. My primary concern is currently self-preservation. But if I could get my hands on that phone, maybe I'd have a chance at calling for help. 
With no time to think about how futile it might be, I bolted towards the truck. To my surprise, the stranger didn't follow me immediately. Instead, he let out an ear-piercing shriek that left me feeling disoriented and filled with dread. Once I reached the cab of my truck and retrieved my phone, I quickly dialed for help while keeping an eye on the stranger who stood facing me. He didn't move any closer this time but maintained his menacing expression. No sooner had a tinny voice come through the line questioning my emergency than the stranger did something utterly unexpected and disturbing. He unhinged his jaw and retched blood all over himself before letting out another terrifying scream, louder than before, which cracked windshields nearby and seemed almost inhuman in nature. In all honesty, it felt as if he had taken a turn away from humans into some demonic form. The bloodied man then bolted into the woods along the road without another glance at me or the truck he'd been so intent on destroying moments earlier. Eventually, the police arrived at my location after what felt like an eternity of standing there, shivering in disbelief. I explained the situation to them as best I could and a manhunt began for the stranger that terrorized me. Soon after, one of the officers claimed that they had heard of this mysterious person before. He told me that some locals had nicknamed him the Red Crowbar, and his reign of terror spanned across several states. Supposedly, he came from a dark and twisted past, leaving a trail of pain and destruction in his wake. As news of my encounter spread, so did theories and speculations about what had happened. People sought to make sense of the incident by piecing together information about the stranger's origin and motives, with some even suggesting that he was an experiment gone wrong in a secret government lab or affiliated with some dark cult. Yet despite everything said about the Red Crowbar, no one knew how to stop him since he always seemed to vanish without a trace after each bloody encounter. I went back to the life I once led, haunted by nightmares of blood-covered men wielding crowbars, wondering when I might next hear that terrible scream. I always listen for reports of red crowbar sightings and know that no one has encountered him again up close without heartbreaking consequences. It serves as a chilling reminder that there are monsters lurking among us, monsters that we can't explain but remain horrified by regardless. And sometimes it's up to fate whether or not you end up miraculously surviving an encounter with such an abomination. It was a lazy Sunday afternoon in July, the kind of day when you wish you were lounging by the pool sipping an ice-cold drink instead of sitting behind the wheel of a truck. The year was 1993, and I was hauling a shipment of electronics across the country to Philadelphia. Little did I know that fateful journey would change my life forever. The sun dipped low in the sky as I approached a crowded rest stop near Cleveland. It had been a long day on the road, so I decided to pull over and stretch my legs before continuing the drive. As I stepped out of my rig, I felt the welcoming assault of humidity against my face and chuckled quietly at how desperate I was to escape it just moments ago. Inside the rest stop, weary travelers were strewn about, grabbing snacks, checking maps on large public payphones, and sharing their own stories from the road. I grabbed myself a hot dog and a lukewarm soda before sitting down next to an elderly couple who seemed to be debating whether or not they could afford new air conditioning for their RV. Our conversation seemed harmless enough until they casually mentioned that they'd heard about some recent unsolved murders in nearby towns. My ears perked up involuntarily as they described the grisly scene found in one particular area, 
rings of mutilated human bodies carelessly strewn about like discarded playthings. An uneasy feeling lodged itself in my gut as if it belonged there, refusing to budge. As much as this crime was unnerving, I managed to shake it off with the assumption that it was none of my business. I got back behind the wheel and hit the road once more, trying to immerse myself in some cheesy comedy tapes I'd bought earlier at a pawn shop. The sun started to set, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch out from all directions while the sky changed its palette from blue to an eerie shade of purple. As I drove under an overpass, there was a sudden flash of motion in my peripheral vision, something falling onto the road next to me. At first, I thought it might have been debris or maybe even a wild animal of some sort. But when I took a closer look, I realized it was a man, disheveled and wearing torn, bloodied clothing. He stumbled around erratically, giving off a sense of panic that made me wary and uneasy at the best. Overwhelmed by my curiosity and concern for this stranger, I reluctantly pulled over to the shoulder to assess the situation. The man looked desperate as he haphazardly charged towards my truck with what appeared to be bound wrists. I tensed up when his bloodshot eyes locked onto mine, connecting us in a traumatic exchange with our shared fear acting as the conductor. It felt like time slowed down for a brief moment as he charged at me with guttural cries escaping from his lips under heavy breaths. The sound of screeching tires pierced through the air behind him, his tormentor matching its prey's foot insolently, leading a gruesome hunt. With a twisted smile etched across his face, he undoubtedly smeared gore, fueling grisly pursuits. I gulped as the inevitable collision course started unveiling. What were they going to do to me? How could I survive? There was no time for any doubt as horror tugged at my collar and forcibly propelled me into the deep unknown. My mind raced as I struggled to decide what to do next. With no time to call for help and concern for the stranger's safety, I made a split-second decision. I swung the door of my truck open, motioning for the man to jump in with haste. He seemed to comprehend my intention and quickly climbed aboard. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, my truck jerking forward in response. In my side mirror, I could see the bloodthirsty figure pursuing us, his face twisted in rage as he lost sight of his victim. The man next to me was trembling, sweat and blood mingling on his pale skin. He was unable to speak but nodded in gratitude when I asked if he was okay. I took a detour towards the nearest town, hoping to find a place where we could safely recover and report the incident to local authorities. With every passing mile marker, the ominous presence that had been seeping into our bones seemed farther away. Upon reaching the safety of town, I rested my truck at a small motel and supported the injured man as we went inside. The motel manager noticed our haggard appearance but didn't question it. Instead, he offered us a room where we could clean up and rest for the night. Once settled in, I stepped outside briefly to grab some snacks from a vending machine. A woman who had been passing by caught sight of the injured man inside our room and stopped me with concern etched on her face. She introduced herself as a nurse named Carol and offered assistance when I explained we barely escaped an attacker. As Carol tended to the stranger's wounds, she told us about infamous serial killer Samuel Cassius, who had been terrorizing unsuspecting travelers in this area for years now. Apparently, his victims were always left mutilated, just like what that elderly couple had described at the rest stop. My heart sank at Carol's revelation, suddenly connecting the grisly crime scenes with our pursuit. 
She pressed us to stay in town and assist with the ongoing investigation. Instead of taking off, we decided to do what we could to help. We provided all the information we had, including our own chilling encounter with someone who might have been the notorious Samuel Cassius. In the coming days, we continued driving towards Philadelphia but couldn't shake off the feeling that we had walked away from something much bigger than ourselves. That rest stop encounter no longer stood alone as an isolated memory pulled from a nightmare. The grisly wounds inflicted by Samuel Cassius on his victims kept invading my thoughts. He remained at large, a dark figure lurking on the periphery of my subconscious, waiting to re-enter my life at any moment. I knew then that this sinister presence would never fully vanish from my mind. The unknown terror I'd felt when confronted with such brutality would echo in me forever, leaving a chilling impact that would seep through even the most mundane of days. I remember the day like it was yesterday. It was October 27, 2015, and I was just beginning another routine haul from Chicago to Philadelphia. As a truck driver, I was used to working all sorts of unpredictable hours, so the late night start time didn't faze me. Little did I know that this seemingly ordinary night would turn into one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. After making my obligatory stop at a roadside diner near Toledo for some greasy burgers and fries, I continued on my way down the highway. The night was cold and unusually silent, aside from the hum of my truck's engine and the sound of tires on wet asphalt. Hours passed by without incident as I traversed the monotonous and seemingly endless stretch of road. It wasn't until I pulled into a rest stop somewhere in Pennsylvania that things started to take a strange, unnerving turn. It must have been around 3.15 a.m. when I parked my truck and walked to the restrooms near the far end of the parking area. The dimly lit building gave me an uneasy feeling as though something sinister was lurking just beyond my line of sight. As I walked out of the restrooms after taking care of business, a tall man with an unkempt beard wearing tattered jeans and a dirty flannel shirt stepped out from a barely noticeable alcove in the building's wall. He shot me a devilish grin as he leaned against the brickwork, revealing his unsteady posture. Without any introduction, he began telling me about how he'd recently lost his job at a steel mill further east in Pennsylvania. His voice was almost calm and comforting despite its slurred words, as if trying to lull me into trustworthiness. And then, out of nowhere, our conversation took an uncomfortably dark turn. He began recounting in graphic detail how he had taken revenge on his former boss by kidnapping his daughter and torturing her, describing each action with such vividness that I felt like a helpless witness. My heart raced as I tried to maintain my composure, fully aware that my truck and any chance of escape were on the other side of this man. Feigning sympathy, I suggested that he may want to talk further at a nearby diner. We began walking back towards the main road, and even though we were moving away from the isolated rest area, his presence loomed larger than ever. Entering the well-lit but empty diner, we found solace in the fact that at least there was a skeleton crew of staff milling about in the kitchen. The man never let his gaze leave mine for an instant as we sat in a booth near the back of the restaurant. Feeling trapped and with no clear path of escape, I asked him why he would trust a complete stranger with such gruesome details. Toying with a salt shaker on the table, he replied coldly, I have nothing to lose, and you never know who might understand why I did what I did. 
or maybe find pleasure thinking about it. His words sent shivers down my spine. I came up with an excuse, needing to go grab some more cash from my truck for food, before disentangling myself from our conversation and leaving as quickly as possible. Avoiding eye contact as I exited the diner, my pulse thundered in my ears. From what seemed like miles away, I saw my truck, but I also noticed another vehicle screeching to life nearby. Panic filled every fiber of my being as I sprinted towards it. I sprinted towards my truck, adrenaline propelling me forward, and struggled to unlock it with trembling hands. Once inside, I locked the doors immediately. I fumbled for my phone, but a sudden realization washed over me. The battery had died during the long drive. I cursed myself for not charging it when I had stopped earlier at the diner. I glanced nervously at the other vehicle, where the headlights shone brighter by the second. The car sped toward me in a seemingly calculated maneuver until it screeched to a halt just inches from my truck. The man was behind the wheel, and, as if suddenly possessed by some demon from deep within his tortured soul, he started to repeatedly ram his vehicle into the side of my truck. Metal crunched and scraped against each other with an unbearable intensity, but my truck managed to stay upright as it absorbed the brunt of the impact. A plan started to form in my mind. If I could make one last quick stop at a nearby service station, maybe someone would be there to help me. As luck would have it, a gas station sign lit up in the distance. The man noticed it, too, and promptly changed tactics. He backed off and aimed his car toward the station with my truck hot on his heels. Upon arrival, I slammed into park mode near the gas pumps and burst out of my cab. The man had pulled up close by and exited his vehicle brandishing a blood-stained tire iron. He moved towards me like an animal stalking prey, slowly and deliberately. A gas station attendant rushed over upon seeing our commotion but froze in place at the sight of the grisly weapon in our assailant's hand. Ignoring the attendant, I called out for anyone else who might be around, desperately hoping someone could come to my aid. Just as the man was about to strike me with his tire iron, Several people from inside the station rushed out, armed with whatever makeshift weapons they could find. With eyes full of rage, the man sized up the situation and decided to flee back into his car. He roared away into the night, leaving me trembling under the glare of those fluorescent lights. The following day, after giving my statement to the police and finding temporary solace in a motel room, a local mechanic told me about a man who used to work at a steel mill nearby, someone notorious for violent outbursts who had been recently released from prison. From the description alone, I knew it was the same man who attacked me. As I prepared to return to my hall, I couldn't shake the feeling that this nightmare was far from over. Despite him being gone for now, deep down, I could sense that our paths were bound to cross again, drawn together like moths to a flame. The only question remained, when? It was the summer of 1991 and I was telling my co-workers about the time I accidentally mixed up diesel fuel for my morning coffee. As usual, laughter erupted as they couldn't resist poking fun at my mishap. In all honesty, I couldn't blame them. Who makes that kind of mistake? Working as a truck driver, life on the road had its perks, but it could get lonely at times. However, during this particular year, I quickly found myself wishing for more solitude. Late August in Memphis was stiflingly hot. 
Despite the AC blasting and cold drinks near me, there was no escaping the sweaty mess that surrounded me both inside and outside my truck. One steamy afternoon, at a desolate truck stop along Route 61, things took a particularly strange turn. While eating lunch inside the dingy cafe, I struck up a conversation with a fellow trucker. His name was Eddie, and he seemed to have a love for humor similar to mine. Just as our conversation delved into our favorite funny stories from the road, an odd-looking man entered the cafe. He had unusually pale skin with sunken eyes that darted around rapidly. His gaunt face was framed by greasy, unkempt hair slicked back haphazardly. The man took a seat at the back of the cafe and opened something that looked like an old photo album or scrapbook. The second he began flipping through it with unsettling obsession in those unnerving eyes of his, I sensed something wasn't right about him. Eddie must have sensed my unease because soon we were exchanging whispers about what creepy McCree person might be doing with that book. Suddenly, an ear-piercing scream rang out behind us as the waitress dropped her tray and staggered backward from our blue-eyed friend's table. The next few moments unfolded like some terrible nightmare. The waitress's leg was severely gashed, and pools of blood began to spread across the floor. The man had taken out a scalpel and was violently attacking the staff, slicing them with precision before they had the chance to react. Eddie and I stared in horror as this maniac continued his rampage, making his way through the cafe one victim at a time. Among the blood and chaos, we agreed that it was time for desperate measures. The two of us quickly grabbed chairs and advanced toward the attacker, hoping to knock him down or at least stun him enough to break free and call for help. But our attempt proved futile. No matter how hard we swung or relented, the man simply danced out of our reach, laughing sinisterly all the while. With each swipe of his scalpel, more people around us crumpled to the floor, their bodies lifeless and horror-stricken. It took every ounce of my courage not to buckle under the pressure as my eyes met those of the deranged man. My hands shaking, I considered trying to call for help, but it was clear that any attempt would be futile under his watchful eye. We had to find a different way out of this nightmare. Eddie and I managed to communicate with our eyes and slight nods, desperately trying to devise a plan while avoiding drawing the man's macabre attention to us. Seeing that the man had targeted everyone in the cafe but hadn't come after us yet, we seized the opportunity to put some distance between the antagonist and us. We slipped behind the counter, where the cafe staff kept a collection of knives, our only chance at stopping him. I grabbed the largest one I could find, struggling with its weight as my hands continued to tremble. We moved as silently as possible, inching closer to the man with each step. Every fiber of my being wanted to cry out for help or scream in terror, but I knew it would only give our position away and bring certain doom. As we neared him, his back turned towards us, and we prepared for our attack. Without warning, Eddie lunged forward and stabbed at the man's shoulder with ferocity. The knife pierced his skin but did not seem to faze him. He spun around with surprising agility for someone who had just been attacked. With those cold blue eyes locked on ours, he grinned menacingly, as if mocking us. The man slashed at Eddie first, now using a second scalpel he pulled from his pocket. The laceration was deep through flesh and muscle, causing Eddie to fall back in pain howling as he clenched onto his freshly opened wound. I tried attacking from behind while his focus was on Eddie. My strike aimed for his neck, but it was blocked by his seemingly supernatural reflexes, 
which he used to redirect my knife jab into thin air. Just like that, during one stride forward that left me exposed and pressed against the booth's countertop, I glanced at the means to make my exit. I ran, my heart pounding, rushing through the cafe and out the door. My heart raced with terror upon reaching the truck stop's parking lot. I knew that he could dart out at any moment and gut me like a fish. A sharp pain shot through my side as I gasped for breath, only to realize it was just a stitch from running so hard. But Eddie was still in there, undoubtedly suffering unimaginable torture at the hands of that merciless fiend. I frantically grabbed my portable CB radio from my truck, calling for police assistance, hoping they would reach us in time. My voice was shaky as I relayed our dire situation, an unknown attacker within a deserted truck stop, mercilessly slaughtering people. By the time they arrived, their sirens piercing through the thick late summer air, everything had changed once again. I waited with bated breath as officers searched the premises, only for them to conclude that the man responsible was no longer on sight. Eddie barely survived that grisly attack but refused to speak of it again. Not even to me. It wasn't until years after Eddie's death that I finally discovered who attacked us during that long past broiling day at the Route 61 cafe when an investigative journalist found me. They were working tirelessly to uncover the truth about infamous serial killer Victor Suvorov. They stunned me as they showed me an old photograph of his ghastly acts with a note featuring our assailant from Memphis. Even now, knowing who it was back then hasn't made me feel any better about what transpired, nor does it help quiet the dread of thinking about how many victims before and after might have succumbed to Suvorov's twisted carnage. The nightmares are still as vivid as they were back then. We might have escaped that decrepit cafe all those years ago, but we were never free of Victor Suvorov and the barbaric carnage he was capable of. I remember that chilly afternoon in October of 2007, when my CB radio crackled to life and a weary voice came through. Hey, this is Rattlesnake Pete. Didn't your mama ever tell you it's rude to have your brights on while passing someone? Considering I had all but forgotten the headlights of my truck in the haste of hauling another cross-country cargo load to Memphis, it seemed like a fair reprimand. Yeah, I chuckled back into the receiver. Sorry about that. I've been on the road for hours, and my brain's a little fried. I noticed the license plate of the car in question as it pulled away in front of me. It was an old, rusty Ford with Nebraska plates. BF2W12. That should have been my first clue that something was off. My trucking route took me through sleepy towns and desolate highways, but today something felt different. The wind rustled leaves across the asphalt like whispering ghosts. In each town, I saw fewer and fewer people milling about until the streets were deserted entirely. Around dusk, I stopped at a rest stop along I-40 just outside Knoxville. The place was eerily silent, save for the occasional creak of an old sign swinging overhead. Rifling through my pockets for spare change to grab a soda from one of the vending machines lining the empty parking lot, my hand brushed against a sweaty dollar bill that would work just fine. As I approached one of the machines, Mountain Dew in mind, I could feel a presence nearby that sent chills down my spine. Looking up, there he was a man leaning against a decrepit picnic table just outside the dim light cast by dying fluorescence above. He appeared tall and wiry, like he hadn't slept or eaten properly in days. 
His eyes were hidden beneath an unkempt tangle of hair, dragged down by the weight of grease. Hey there, I forced cheerily through gritted teeth. Long day on the road, huh? Yeah, he replied, his voice a hoarse whisper that set my nerves on edge, like chalk screeching across a blackboard. As I turned back to the vending machine and hurriedly inserted the damp dollar, the hairs on the back of my neck prickled. This guy must have been watching me for a while. Deciding it was best to get on my way, I started back toward my cab with a brisk pace, imagining that the faster I moved, the further I'd be from this forsaken rest stop and its creepy inhabitant. But as I passed him by, he hissed something that raised every hair on my body. I know your darkest fears, he whispered. Don't be ridiculous. I snapped back before hustling into my truck and slamming the door. But sure enough, at every turn, he was in my peripheral vision. I tried to shake him off with speed and evasive maneuvers more suited to a sports car than an 18-wheeler. Yet no matter what I did or where I turned, I always saw his hollowed face lurking in mere slapped side windows, an endless puppet show forced on me by stagehand dread. The haunting stretched into the night as his attacks grew bolder. The first scratches appeared along the undercarriage of my truck whenever I stopped at traffic lights or sought sanctuary in gas stations. Soon, vicious remarks materialized on windshields and walls. I am your fear. On and on it went until, finally, exhausted beyond all reason, I decided it was time to confront this seemingly invincible tormentor. I drove my truck into an abandoned loading dock near Chattanooga as daylight flickered over the dead husks of factories. My body trembled as adrenaline surged through every fiber of my being when I stepped out onto the cold asphalt armed with nothing but determination and a tire iron. I swung the tire iron in my hand and yelled out to the eerie emptiness that surrounded me. Show yourself! Let's end this once and for all! Seconds passed like hours, with my heart pounding in my throat. And then he emerged. The man stepped out of a shadowy corner, his hollowed face now more menacing than ever. He said nothing but simply stood there, staring at me with his cold eyes. His silence only fueled my fury. I charged forward, determined to put an end to this torment. But just as I was about to swing the tire iron down on him, he vanished before my eyes, leaving only a ghastly wail behind that echoed throughout the loading dock. A sharp pain shot through my left arm like something with many teeth had bit down on it. I grasped it tightly and fought back a scream. And then I heard it, a rustling behind me. As I turned around, trying not to let the pain distract me, there he was again, like some sort of specter capable of appearing and disappearing whenever it suited him. My phone rang suddenly from inside the truck's cab. I hesitated for a moment but decided this was as good a time as any to call for help. Although none of my friends or family had any experience handling supernatural threats like this, at least someone would know what to do or who to ask for help. 911, a voice answered on the other end of the line. With urgency staining my voice, I poured out every detail of what had transpired since that Nebraska license plate caught my eye, BF2W12. The eerie scenes at every rest stop, his scratchings on windshields and walls. But before I could finish explaining the situation unfolding in front of me, the line went dead. As if taunting me even further, his haunting laugh echoed through the loading dock once more. I watched in horror as he laid waste to every part of my truck within arm's length. But rather than submit, that laugh only stoked my resolve. 
and suddenly it hit me. I knew how to stop him. With everything I had, I swung the tire iron straight towards his face, clenching my teeth against the pain in my arm. He frustratedly tried to disappear again, but this time I struck him before he could do so, iron meeting flesh with a sickening crunch. He collapsed onto the cold asphalt, groaning in agony. I watched as he tried to pick himself up and use his supernatural abilities to vanish once more, but something was different now. As he struggled to catch his breath, a man stumbled into the loading dock from a nearby alley. He revealed he had witnessed everything through shaky eyes and said, You, you won. I was one of his victims too. His name is Mordecai Ellis. Mordecai lay motionless on the ground, completely defeated and unable to harm another driver again. While he had not been captured or killed, it seemed that being physically overcome by sheer determination had broken whatever kind of dark power granted him his terrifying abilities. The man continued tremblingly. He hurt my family. And when no one would help me, he started hurting me. Tears welled up in his eyes as he choked out these last words. I realized then that despite what had occurred at each of those stops— Despite all the bizarre and terrifying things that had taken place, it didn't matter who Mordecai hurt or how many times we tried to move on with our lives. What mattered was standing up for ourselves and taking back control of our own destinies. For even when we found ourselves staring into the icy heart of our darkest fears or feeling helpless under the weight of ghostly fingertips on our necks until it was almost too much to bear, there would always be hope for the stubborn, those brave souls who refused to let anything stop them from pressing on through the night. It was Tuesday, October 28, 1997. I remember it because it was the same day I received my monthly truck assignment. That day provided a welcome distraction from the mind-numbing routine of long hauls and lonely nights. I was working as a truck driver, ferrying goods all over this great land of ours. Life on the road wasn't easy, but it paid the bills and kept me from feeling stuck in one place. I picked up a load of paint from a warehouse in Rockford, Illinois, bound for a retailer down in Savannah, Georgia. It was around 6 p.m. when I grabbed a bite to eat at this small greasy spoon diner near the highway. I couldn't help but overhear an old man seated at the counter grumbling about some guy named Henry who managed to get out of every jam by sheer luck or charm, or at least that's what he figured. Chuckling to myself, I returned to my truck and began my long journey. At first, things were as mundane as usual, cruising through the countryside with only my trusty CB radio for company. That is until around midnight, when I stopped at a small truck stop just outside Bowling Green, Kentucky. As I stepped outside to stretch my legs and fuel up on some coffee, an eerie fog rolled in all around me. The sight of an approaching figure in this haze made me uneasy, but soon enough, a man came into view. He looked to be about fifty-something with graying hair and bushy eyebrows that seemed permanently arched, as if he were constantly surprised or shocked by something. He wore shabby clothes and walked with a slight slouch. "'What are you hauling?' he asked me casually, completely ignoring any sort of greeting before diving right into business. It struck me as odd. Most folks tend to chat about the weather first. Paints, I replied cautiously, noticing his gaze sweeping over the sides of the truck, which displayed a bright yellow logo. Crazy what they can do with paint these days, huh? He remarked, flashing a crooked grin. 
My name's Gil. I've been hauling furniture all over the country for years now. We exchanged pleasantries as we talked about life on the road, though he seemed strangely interested in my cargo. Eventually, we parted ways, and I continued on my journey, but not without an unnerving sense that this encounter would come back to haunt me. The night wore on, no different than any of my multiple halls. I focused primarily on staying awake, trying to avoid any ominous thoughts infringing upon my hazy, sleep-deprived mind. It wasn't long before I stopped at another truck stop to grab a quick bite and a coffee top-up. While I was drowsily consuming my food, I idly checked out the news reports on the small television hanging up in the corner. The local station was reporting a heinous crime spree assaults on truck drivers delivering various shipments. They showed images of mangled bodies found near highways. Some had been burned alive inside their trucks. Fear started to creep up my spine as I recalled my earlier encounter with Gil. The peculiar questions he asked kept echoing in my head. Could he be responsible for these horrific acts? What if his interest in paint is somehow connected to this madness? I shook off those dark thoughts and resolved to keep a watchful eye on my surroundings for any signs of trouble. It couldn't hurt to proceed with caution until I reached Savannah. The fog grew denser as I continued down the highway. The radio sung spooky tunes about strange happenings while keeping me company through the wilderness stretching out before me. Suddenly, I spotted headlights approaching from behind, too quickly by anyone's standards for such weather conditions. As they drew nearer, I could scarcely make out the silhouette of a battered old pickup truck. My mind raced back to Gil, his beat-up truck and sketchy demeanor. Panic seized me, praying he wasn't really the monster on the prowl I feared he might be. Chills rippled across my body as the pickup truck drew level with me on the highway, its headlights illuminating only a sliver of the darkness that surrounded us. The pickup truck pulled up alongside me, and I held my breath, clenching the steering wheel tightly. To my surprise, the window on the driver's side rolled down, revealing a young woman holding a map. Hastily, she yelled out over the roar of our engines. Hey! Is this the way to Savannah? Relieved that it was not Gil, I called back. Yes, just keep going straight. The woman nodded her thanks and drove off into the foggy night. My heart began to slow its pulsing. However, my suspicion of Gil persisted. He had seemed strangely interested in my cargo, and I couldn't help but think he could be connected to the attacks on truck drivers. When I reached a rest stop near Chattanooga, Tennessee, I decided to call for help. Dialing the local police department, I explained my concerns about Gill and his potential involvement in the horrific crimes reported on the news. They promised to look into it further and assured me that they would contact me if they discovered anything relevant. The next day began uneventfully. The fog had dissipated, giving way to sunny skies as I continued my journey towards Savannah. As I stopped at another truck stop just outside making for a coffee refill and some lunch, I noticed a group of truckers animatedly discussing something huddled around a television set in the corner. Approaching the group cautiously, I overheard snippets of their conversation. Poor guy didn't have a chance, mutilated beyond recognition. My anxiety skyrocketed. Another truck driver had been gruesomely murdered. And by what they were saying, it seemed worse than ever before. I moved closer to view the screen as chills filled my body devouring every detail about this monster among men. The reporters shared unsettling information about accounts of bizarre symbols drawn with blood at each crime scene, 
as well as grisly descriptions of the barely recognizable corpses of the victims. With each revelation, my fear of Gil grew. Was he the one responsible for these ghastly deaths? I knew that I couldn't let this continue. Despite having reported my suspicions to the Chattanooga authorities, I felt a deeper sense of responsibility. Could I have meant something to these truckers taken too soon had I intervened sooner? In any case, resolve strengthened within me. My initial assumption about him had to be validated. Otherwise, this menace could continue terrorizing the roads at will. Two days later, on October 30th, just hours before reaching Savannah, my phone rang. The officer from Chattanooga informed me they'd completed their investigation and tracked Gill down through records provided by his employer. Indeed, Gill had been arrested in a backwater motel. His truck contained items stolen from other truck drivers on his route, alongside grisly trophies from his victims. His full name was Gilbert Franz Wessler, and he had worked as a furniture hauler for ten years. Officers found an extensive journal amidst crumpled clothes and filthy fast food wrappers detailing his sadistic tendencies and motivations, revenge and pure hatred for fellow truckers. It seemed as though our chance encounter was simply wicked luck or fate itself. Though justice would be served in time for the victims of his bloody carnage, I couldn't shake the shadows of what could have befallen me and many others if not for a swift turn of providence on that fateful foggy night. Even now, as I sit in my favorite roadside diner sipping coffee in peace, chills take hold of my spine every time headlights illuminate the vast darkness just outside. I was behind the wheel of my big rig, making my way across the vast expanse of Arizona. It was June 27, 1997, a date I'll never forget. The weather was dry, which made every breath feel thirstier than the last. My CB radio crackled to life as I exchanged some friendly banter with fellow truckers on the open road. The sun had dipped below the horizon, leaving the skies alight with vibrant shades of orange and purple. I pulled up at an old gas station that hadn't seen any proper maintenance in years. As I parked to grab a cup of coffee, I saw a young man who quickly caught my attention. There was something odd about him. He had an unkempt beard, greasy hair, and wild eyes that darted around constantly. He wore filthy clothes that seemed to cling to his lanky frame. Got any spare change? He whispered hoarsely. I dug into my pocket and handed him a couple of crumpled bills. He thanked me fervently and scurried away into the growing darkness. Back inside my truck, the air felt unnaturally cold as I sipped on my bitter brew, putting it down to being overtired. Forcing myself back into alertness with a loud sigh, I prepared to get back on the move. Just when I turned the key in the ignition, there was a sickening thud from somewhere outside that sent shockwaves through the cabin. With wide eyes and bulging veins, I clambered out only to see human teeth scattered near my front tire, as if someone had smashed their jaw right on it. Freaking out, I sprinted around expecting to see an injured person or body when suddenly, that young man from earlier emerged from behind a nearby trailer with blood gushing from his mouth. Did you miss me? He mumbled through broken teeth and blood, a demented grin twisting beneath his ruined lips. My chest was pounding like a drum as I tried to figure out what had just happened. He clasped my hand with a vice-like grip pulling me closer, his breath foul with the tang of metal and rot. I've got some friends that really want to meet you. 
Something about his words sent chills down my spine. He wasn't making any sense. As he attempted to lead me further away from my truck, a sudden realization hit me. This dude might have followed me after I gave him money earlier. Maybe he was part of a group. Maybe they were luring helpless truckers into some sort of twisted trap. Terrified at the thought, I desperately yanked my hand free as suddenly, two more messy figures slinked out from behind the derelict station. My body screamed at me to run back to the sanctuary of my truck's cabin, but instead, I reached under my seat for a crowbar I kept in case of emergencies. All thoughts of rational response abandoned me as I gripped it tightly, sweat slicking against the cold steel. Hey now, we don't want any trouble, one of his cohorts said, putting both hands up in mock surrender. Well, then leave me alone and let me get back on my way. I yelled back in terror. But there was no turning back now. That same sickly man who spoke earlier lunged at me suddenly with a guttural snarl, forcing me to swing the crowbar wildly. It connected with an audible crunch, and he collapsed like a ragdoll. I didn't have time to catch my breath before the others were upon me. The young man grappled for the crowbar while another scrappy fellow leaped onto my back like a twisted spider monkey. I swung the crowbar backward, detaching the scrappy fellow from my back, and spun around to confront the young man once again. The heavy weight of the crowbar in my trembling hands provided a shred of reassurance. Still, I knew it wouldn't be enough against these three crazed individuals. Back off! I shouted through gritted teeth, my eyes darting between them. Let me go, or I swear I'll beat all your brains out with this thing. The two remaining attackers seemed to hesitate momentarily before glancing at each other and then nodding silently in unison. A horrible understanding passed between them. As their menacing smiles grew wider, they both reached down to reveal homemade shivs made from rusted metal scratches that gleamed in the dim light. It was clear they'd done this before and intended to finish what they started. Realizing I was outmatched, I turned and sprinted towards the road while screaming for help at the top of my lungs. The weight of the crowbar slowed me down but also gave me a twisted sense of security. To my surprise and immense relief, another trucker had just pulled into the gas station. He was big and burly, with tattoos running up his arms and across his head. The man heard my cries for help and immediately retrieved a tire iron from his cab. Together, we stood face to face with the attackers, who paused uncertainly, seeing that they were now outnumbered and potentially outgunned. Deciding it was best to regroup for now, they darted into the darkness surrounding them until their twisted grins vanished like ghosts in the night. The tattooed trucker introduced himself as Frank. He suggested we call the police immediately, to which I nodded in agreement, grateful for someone else taking control of this nightmare situation. We relayed our harrowing experience to a skeptical police officer when he arrived on the scene. The officer advised us that there had been several incidents in the area involving aggressive drifters, all with eerily similar descriptions. With the police now involved, Frank and I bid each other farewell, exchanging thanks and heartfelt handshakes before hitting the road once more. Our attackers remained at large and evaded capture, slipping through the cracks like shadows of humanity. I later learned that their leader was named Caleb. Information obtained from a third party with surprisingly extensive knowledge about this murderous gang. I continued my work as a trucker but never stopped thinking about the people who had fallen prey to Caleb's group. Their names and stories haunted me like whispers in my ears every time the wind whistled through my truck's windows. 
Despite those terrifying memories straining against the fabric of my dreams, somehow they became fuel for me to keep going. To keep fighting for those who may not have had anyone on their side during their ultimate moment of terror. Just as I had been lucky enough to have Frank at mine, as I lay in my cab each night on future long hauls, the eerie wind would whistle softly. Who would be next? Would Caleb strike again, fulfilling his twisted desires for another unsuspecting victim? I would never really know. But one thing remained certain. As long as I was behind the wheel, trucking along these desolate highways, I refused to forget. And with every mile, I carried their memories and their stories, making sure they didn't vanish into the darkness like Caleb and his cohorts hoped they would. Back in the summer of 2000, I was a rookie truck driver, barely a year into the job. At that time, I was working for a small company that made deliveries throughout the Northeast. Aside from the long hours and tiresome nights on the road, I found joy in making people laugh with my witty humor and random observations. On one particularly uneventful July evening, I was driving through rural Pennsylvania just before midnight when I heard something that made me pull over and stop. It was an unsettling screeching sound that pierced the otherwise peaceful night air. It couldn't have been an animal or vehicle, as it seemed too sharp and painful for any living creature or machine to make. I reluctantly got out of my truck to see if I could find the source of the noise. The tall trees loomed overhead as I peered into the pitch-black darkness surrounding me. Suddenly, out of nowhere... A flash of headlights illuminated a beaten-up old red car parked in one of those secluded spots reserved for lovers and thrill-seekers. As I approached the car, I noticed that one of its tires had been slashed. Poor folks were probably having a rough night. The sight of the mutilated tire made me shiver, but there was something even more disturbing about it, a metallic smell lingering in the air. In no mood to play hero, I decided it'd be best to call for help from my truck. As I walked back toward my rig, I stumbled upon something glistening on the ground. It was a bloody knife, partially hidden under some leaves. What's left of my courage quickly evaporated like sweat under the summer sun. Someone in this area could be hurt, or even killed. As sweat poured down my forehead and soaked my thin t-shirt, fear crept up like an icy hand grabbing hold of my spine. I carefully walked back towards my truck with heavy steps. Every crunch of gravel beneath my feet sent my heart racing. Once inside, I frantically dialed 911 as adrenaline rippled through me like the heartbeat of a frenzied animal. The dispatcher on the other end of the line tried to reassure me that help was on its way, but her thin voice wasn't enough to quell my nerves. As the minutes dragged on like hours, I debated whether I should wait in my truck or try to find a safer place to hide. Finally, I spotted headlights approaching in my rearview mirror. It was the police, coming to save me from whatever twisted situation I'd stumbled upon. Two officers exited their squad car and huddled together near their vehicle before walking over to speak with me. Earlier in the night, I would have cracked a joke or pulled some witty lines, but at that moment, all I could do was answer their questions, still trying hard not to think about whoever or whatever had caused everything that happened here tonight. The officers escorted me back to the abandoned car and were speechless at what they found there. A man was slumped against the steering wheel, his face lost in a sea of thick blood. It seemed as though he had been dead for several hours already. As we stood there gazing at this gruesome sight, 
one of the officers mentioned. We've been tracking someone, a man who's responsible for similar crimes across several states. Suddenly, from behind us came that blood-curdling screech again as branches snapped and leaves rustled nearby. My heart felt like it had stopped before resuming with a deafening thud echoing in my ears. With fear gripping my mind and body, I froze as the police officers moved cautiously toward the location of the screeching noise. Their flashlights pierced the darkness, revealing the mutilated bodies of several people scattered among the tall trees. The sight was horrendous and gory, with body parts ripped apart by an unknown force and strewn across the ground. It was clear that these victims suffered a horrifying death. Shocked, I stood motionless, trying to process the tragedy in front of me. The officers radioed for backup while carefully examining the gruesome scene. As we waited for assistance, a nearby officer spoke softly about a serial killer named Joseph Langley, who had been terrorizing various states, leaving behind similar scenes of destruction. The horrified murmurs among the officers suggested that this brutal massacre could be Langley's handiwork. Despite their previous experiences with such cases, it was apparent these seasoned and battle-hardened officers were struggling to maintain their composure in light of this appalling sight before us. Backup arrived soon after and began securing the area. As they ventured deeper into the woods, Following a trail of blood and carnage, they found more high-resolution photographs of other victims pinned on trees like trophies. As the hours went by, an expert in criminal psychology joined us in our search for Langley. Listening to her speak with law enforcement, I learned about Langley's background. His childhood abuse had led him to develop sadistic tendencies which he honed on helpless victims. The expert described how Langley's twisted psyche compelled him to inflict unimaginable pain upon people to make them feel dominant and powerful. His pattern of crime had evolved into gruesome scenes like the one we discovered that night. The search continued but yielded no leads. It seemed that Langley knew our every move and had vanished into thin air as if taunting us. A few days later, an anonymous informant reached out to authorities with crucial information on Langley's whereabouts. They quickly relayed this news to the task force, and a massive operation to apprehend the monstrous killer had begun. Still haunted by what I had seen, I couldn't help but follow the news closely. As teams closed in on the suspect's location, reports emerged stating that Langley was not found at the scene. Instead, they discovered evidence of yet another brutal killing. Langley remained elusive while leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. Mere moments too late, it seemed we were always one step behind him. And as for me... No matter how much time passed or how many miles I logged in my truck, I carried the dark memories of that grim night with me wherever I went. The faces of Langley's victims would often visit me in my dreams, making me feel guilty for being unable to save them. My only hope was that one day, justice would be served and the nightmare would come to an end. I was cruising along I-95 during the summer of 1998, with the gentle hum of my 18-wheeler for company. Our truck stop banter brought a much-needed balance to those long stretches of isolation on the road, and that was what kept most of us going. I remember my buddy, Joe, was telling a hilarious story over the CB radio about how he tried to impress a waitress at the local diner and ended up spilling hot coffee all over himself instead. As I continued down the highway, a light rain began to fall. Soon, 
it turned into a proper downpour. The wind was howling, tossing my rig back and forth until I decided it was best to pull over and wait it out for a bit. I noticed an old diner off to the side as I approached an exit ramp. It seemed like a perfect spot to park and grab a coffee while waiting for Mother Nature to settle down. The moment I stepped out of the cab, I realized that the rain had grown even worse. It was pounding like fists on my windshield. I shuffled into the worn-down diner and took a seat at the counter. Looking around, I saw that it hadn't changed much since the last time I'd stopped by. The paintings on the wall were fading, and the vintage jukebox still occupied its corner spot, though it had likely played its last tunes many years prior. A girl no older than twenty appeared from behind an ancient espresso machine and took my order. She flashed me an exhausted smile that seemed reserved just for weary truckers. Getting pretty nasty out there, she remarked as she handed back my fresh cup of joe. Yeah, I couldn't see more than ten feet in front of me, I agreed. I sipped my coffee in silence while watching raindrops race down the window. A flash of movement caught my eye. Outside, there appeared to be a figure hunched over and attempting to break into another trucker's parked rig. This guy, whoever he was, seemed determined, his face obscured by a hood. I alerted the diner operator about the situation, telling her I'd go confront the intruder. She insisted on calling the cops, assuring me they'd be there in no time. Knowing that supplies on rigs like mine were worth a small fortune, I doubted we had that long to spare. With some reluctance, I ventured into the storm and stomped my way through puddles as I closed in on the figure. He wielded a crowbar, prying away at the padlock with vigor despite my approaching footsteps. Hey! I shouted when I was just ten feet away from him. The man froze for an instant before starting to run off down the street. Something inside me snapped. The adrenaline took over as I gave chase, not realizing how dangerous this decision could be. At one point, he turned onto an unlit side street and was out of sight. Still fuming. I followed close behind but couldn't see him anywhere. Suddenly, just as I decided to give up and return to my truck, I felt him slam into me from the shadows. I was caught off guard. I was no match for his desperate rage. He brought down the crowbar on my forearm with an agonizing crack. Blood ran cold down my arm as jagged bolts of pain radiated through every fiber of my being. Gritting my teeth, I struggled to stand up. My arm throbbed with pain, but I couldn't let this man get away. Clutching my injured forearm, I hobbled after the assailant. My vision blurred as rain and blood mixed together, but I refused to give up. The hooded figure rounded another corner, the crowbar still in hand. Spotting a metal pipe nearby, I grabbed it for self-defense and continued to pursue him. The wet streets reflected only glimpses of the moonlight, making it difficult to keep track of the man's whereabouts. As I limped through a narrow alleyway, a piercing scream echoed through the night. With a newfound sense of urgency, I trudged ahead despite my battered body. Reaching the source of the cries, I discovered a young couple huddled together. The woman was sobbing with terror. Her partner lay sprawled on the ground. What happened? I asked, glancing around for any sign of our attacker. The, the guy. He just attacked us out of nowhere. She stammered between sobs. Ignoring my own pain, I assisted the couple as we hurried back to the diner, hoping that more people would deter further violence from our mysterious assailant. Once inside, we found caves raining. 
two police officers were questioning witnesses and rapidly jotting down statements. The operator had successfully reached them earlier when she saw me attacking the hooded figure. I reported what I'd found in the alley to an officer before excusing myself to clean up in the bathroom. One look in the mirror revealed just how much damage had been done. My face was swollen and bruised, and blood had dried along my cheek. As for my arm, the slightest movement sent spasms of pain coursing through me like electric shocks. After rejoining Joe and the rest of the panicked diners, I learned what little information they had discovered. The attacker was known as the Hooded Hound, a name given to an elusive, violent criminal who targeted truckers and their rigs. Police had been attempting to catch him for months, but he always seemed to vanish without a trace. As I stared out of the rain-streaked window, wondering if I'd ever encounter the Hooded Hound again, Joe urged me to head home, promising to help manage the situation there. My truck still sat outside, untouched and unscathed from the mayhem that had unfolded. With a nod of gratitude, I slipped into the driver's seat. I spotted a note on my dashboard as I fumbled for the keys. Unfolding the damp paper revealed crude handwriting. I'll be seeing you again, trucker. An icy chill spread through my veins at the realization that this wasn't over. Whether driven by insanity or pure malice, the hooded hound was far from done with me. Still shaken, I drove off into the night with my headlights slicing through the darkness, an eerie reminder of what awaited in my future encounters with the hooded hound. It was one unforgettable Tuesday morning, right after the 4th of July celebrations. The year was 1998, and I remember it so clearly because that's when people could not stop talking about President Clinton's scandal. Those were simpler times in some ways, but not for me, as I was about to find out. My name is Jacob Prescott, and back in 98... I worked as a truck driver for a modest company based in Alabama. This particular day started just like any other. After having breakfast at a local diner and laughing with the waitress about a new joke making the rounds, I hopped back into my truck and started my shift. I had a long haul ahead of me, from Birmingham to Austin, Texas. As usual, my trustworthy radio was by my side to keep me company. I had been on the road for a couple of hours when I stopped by a gas station to refuel and grab a quick coffee. That's when things first seemed unusual. It wasn't anything specific, just an odd sense of unease that hung in the air. As people pumped gas or bought snacks from inside the store, there was an unsettling silence that lingered. No small talk or laughter like usual. Dismissing it as nothing more than collective fatigue after the weekend festivities, I continued on my journey. A few hours later, driving somewhere just outside of Memphis, Tennessee, required me to take a detour through some back roads due to construction up ahead. As twilight set in and forested roads grew darker with each passing mile, my headlights caught something peculiar lying on the ground beside the road. On edge already from before and unable to resist my curiosity, I stepped out of my truck to get a closer look. What lay just off the road was horrifying, an artfully arranged pile of human teeth. Feeling sickened and disturbed by what I'd discovered, I couldn't help but feel a deep chill within me. I quickly got back inside my truck and dialed the police using my trusty Nokia phone. After explaining to the operator what I had found, her unnaturally calm voice told me to wait, and they would send someone out to investigate. I remained in my vehicle, 
anxiously watching my surroundings while waiting for the police to arrive. As I glanced at the rearview mirror, I noticed something in the corner of my eye, a figure standing amid the shadows beside the road. The person was tall, with a hunched frame and features that were difficult to discern from this distance. Nervously, I reached out again to the emergency services dispatcher, telling them about the figure before me. Despite their reassurances, I remained fearful of what might transpire in those moments alone on that deserted road. My heart pounded wildly in my chest as each minute stretched on for what seemed like hours. Suddenly, in an instant that only lasted mere fractions of a second, something slammed into my truck with such force that the vehicle rocked violently back and forth. Startled and terrified, I stared wide-eyed into my side mirror, trying to make out the attacker, but there was nothing there except darkness. As if on cue, sirens could be heard approaching in the distance filling me with both relief and renewed panic. Fearful of what might happen next but too terrified to step out of my truck again, I held on to the steering wheel with wide-knuckled fists while waiting for the police officers to arrive on scene. As the police cars pulled up, their lights pierced through the darkness of the back road. Two officers stepped out and approached my truck, and I briefed them on the figure I had seen lurking nearby. They surveyed my surroundings while one officer stayed with me, asking further questions about the pile of teeth. With a sigh, the officer who had scouted beyond my truck returned. We couldn't find anyone around here. It's really weird. Whatever this was, it seems to have disappeared. Hesitant to admit my fears, I described the hunched figure I'd spotted earlier, but they dismissed my concerns as possibly an animal or my imagination playing tricks on me in the darkness. Listen, Jacob. The officer started as he scribbled some notes down on his pad. What you came across tonight is indeed frightening, not just for you but for all of us. We've been finding similar occurrences in our region lately but we don't know who or what is behind it. He blinked and suddenly seemed to realize he'd said too much before quickly looking back at his notepad. Days later, after arriving in Austin and completing my hall delivery, I couldn't shake the eerie feelings I carried with me from that desolate back road. My curiosity drove me to research local news stories about similar incidents. Unfortunately, information was scarce. It seemed as if law enforcement was doing their best to keep things under wraps. A week went by when I met with a fellow truck driver named Sam during a stopover at a diner franchise we both frequented near Birmingham. He'd heard through some acquaintances of his that people were calling this unknown figure, the dentist. I don't know much more than that. Sam admitted with a worried glance around the diner's patrons. But they say the dentist doesn't just stop at teeth. He likes to play with other bones, too. Disturbed by the details provided to me, I pressed on with my work and tried focusing on the aspects of life that brought me joy. But those words stayed with me for days, echoing in my ears, the dentist. As if by fate... I started hearing even more rumors and whispered conversations about the dentist around town. Every account was eerily similar to what I had experienced that night. A ghastly pile of human remains, a tall, hunched figure, and a crippling sensation of fear that lingers long after the incident is over. The unease of the entire situation caused my work performance to slip. After several nights of restless sleep, I confided my fears in one of my oldest friends, who worked as a detective for the Birmingham Police Department. He cautioned me to stay away from the subject matter because it was a real dangerous rabbit hole to go down. 
Despite his advice, my experiences continued to haunt me. That's when I vowed that I would dedicate myself to uncovering the truth behind the dentist. Rumors swirled about an individual orchestrating these gruesome attacks without having an apparent motive or identity. Years went by as more incidents were reported on back roads like mine. Although news stories remained scarce, people discussed other ghastly findings similar to the one I had stumbled upon. While no one could say much about the dentist's physical appearance, or why he targeted his victims, his bizarre acts seemed meticulously planned yet unnervingly random. Time has not provided clarity or taken away the dentist's strange grip on my mind, nor has it eased anyone's terror regarding him. My obsession has grown over the years, turning into a solitary pursuit where others have deemed me mad for chasing an enigma that has haunted me since that unforgettable Tuesday morning. I find myself wondering if it was fate that led me on this path or mere happenstance. Perhaps even curiosity's cruel grip kept me from moving past that night. I am acutely aware that each step I take brings me closer to an unseen force and further into the clutches of darkness. But now, perhaps my fear and my need to uncover his secrets lure the dentist even closer. Back in 1993, I was 25 years old and working as a truck driver, delivering goods across the United States. My life was a simple one, driving on endless highways during the day and resting in truck stops at night. At that time, gas stations were mostly frequented by truck drivers. It was an unwritten rule that when you saw another trucker filling up his gas tank, you didn't park your vehicle too close. We all needed some space and alone time after being confined to the confines of our trucks. Maintaining some distance was just an unspoken way of showing respect to one another. One evening in late March or early April, I pulled into a rather small, dimly lit gas station in one corner of Oklahoma. This was years before the invention of smartphones or GPS systems. If you needed directions, you had to stop at a place like this and ask for help. As I got out of my truck to fill up the tank, I noticed another trucker close by. He looked like he'd been on the road for days without rest. His eyes were bloodshot, and some stubble decorated his sunburnt face. I sighed and thought about how this profession, although not glamorous, has its advantages, mainly being alone and not having to deal with people who have poor hygiene. I turned away from him and continued my task, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off about my trucker neighbor. Ignoring my gut feelings and common sense, I decided to break my own unspoken rules about engagement. Man, I said, you look like you could use some rest. He grunted in response but didn't outright dismiss me, as most truckers do. Instead, he took note of the lighter hanging from my jacket pocket and jokingly asked for it without extending his hand. Caught off guard by the request, I hesitated momentarily before reaching for the lighter. But as I stretched to hand it over... He suddenly brandished a hunting knife and plunged it into the arm of another person who had just come up behind me, a random passerby, from the looks of it. Horrified, I leaped back and scrambled to get inside my truck. The trucker laughed maniacally and, with terrifying agility, approached the injured man, who was now writhing in pain. He leaned down and started carving into the man's flesh, creating grotesque patterns that seemed to have no meaning or purpose. Trying to block out the scene unfolding in front of me, I fumbled with my keys, 
finally managing to start my truck and speed away. In my rearview mirror, I caught a last glimpse of the mad trucker grinning at me as he continued his horrific act. Over the few days following my terrifying encounter with the deranged trucker, I pushed myself to continue working. The news reports provided no help, and I couldn't shake the images from that night, the knife, the blood, the mutilated body. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't bring myself to forget what I had witnessed. During a particularly dreary evening spent unloading goods at a warehouse, a fellow trucker named Rick tried to make conversation while we worked. Noticing my despondent mood, he asked if everything was okay. Not really, I admitted. I recently saw something pretty gruesome, and it's been bothering me ever since. His eyes widened with concern but also curiosity. What happened? he inquired. Hesitant at first, I decided to recount the entire incident as best as I could remember it, leaving out no gory detail. To my surprise, Rick's expression transformed from shock to understanding. I think I know who you're talking about, he said cautiously. There's a trucker who's been causing a stir in our community, someone called the Butcher. He targets other truckers, and locals too. A shiver ran down my spine upon hearing that nickname. Really? How do you know it's the same guy? I questioned. Rick scratched his head and explained further. Well, I heard his victims are always found with those weird patterns carved into their bodies, just like what you described. Pretty disturbing stuff. He grimaced as if reliving a terrible memory. I agreed but couldn't shake off one burning question. Why hadn't anyone stopped him? Rick just sighed and shook his head sadly. He always seems to be one step ahead of us all, he replied dejectedly. As time went on, stories about this maniacal figure began to spread from trucker to trucker via CB radios and whispers at truck stops. The Butcher became a kind of enigmatic menace for us all, leaving a trail of blood in his wake. Meanwhile, the trucker community began closing ranks, determined to avoid becoming this man-man's next victim. The usual solidarity we felt began to dissolve into a vague and ever-present dread. One night, after hearing rumors that the butcher had struck again, I found it impossible to sleep. In a moment of decision, I settled on driving through the night instead. As I adjusted my mirrors for the long journey ahead, I noticed something unnerving in my rearview mirror, a truck with bright headlights pulling into the gas station where I was parked. I couldn't see the driver's face or distinguish any identifying features on the truck itself, just those blazing headlights. Not wanting to take any chances, I turned my key and sped off into the darkness. Glancing nervously at my side mirrors as the miles passed by, I couldn't shake the sick feeling that I was being followed. After what felt like an eternity, my hands shaking on the wheel, I reached a safe distance away from anything or anyone that could harm me. But looming in my mind was still that chilling thought, how much longer could we all live in fear? The months went by even as the butcher continued terrorizing people in our community. People were frightened and stressed. Some had even considered quitting trucking altogether. One factor remained constant throughout this entire ordeal. Nobody could catch him or even put a name to this terrifying figure. Eventually, whispers slowly faded, as if people resigned themselves to his perpetual presence or decided it was too risky to discuss him out loud. Perhaps some thought ignoring him might put an end to his gruesome spree of violence. As for me, 
My journey as a truck driver continued with caution and trepidation. Whenever another trucker disappeared or was found brutally murdered, I could not help but remember the horrors I witnessed firsthand. Though time eventually mended some parts of my life, the linchpin remains clear. That deranged man will forever haunt me, like a bloody specter lingering in my mind. And so we all carried on, knowing that, somewhere out there, this murderous fiend still roamed free. Meanwhile, the unanswered questions ate away at us all. The butcher lived on. No one could predict where he'd strike next or when he would claim another victim. The year was 1998, and I remember the hot summer breeze blowing against my face as I prepared to climb back into my truck after a quick pit stop at one of those mom-and-pop gas stations just off the highway. I didn't know it back then, but I was about to experience a dark and twisted turn of events that would leave me questioning everything. It was just another ordinary day for me. I'd been driving trucks for over a decade, crisscrossing the United States from coast to coast. The job had its perks, the ever-changing scenery, making new friends, visiting familiar places, and made for interesting stories when I met people in my travels. My drive that fateful day took me through Michigan, passing through Flint on my way to Detroit. It was late afternoon when I pulled into a rest area for a bathroom break and to grab something to eat before continuing on my journey. As I was washing my hands in the rundown restroom, a stocky man with salt and pepper hair walked in. He had deep-set eyes surrounded by heavy wrinkles, revealing many years spent staring at road maps and counting hours behind the wheel. He nodded at me as he went about his business, taking care of the usual tasks truckers engage in during these short stops. Been on the road long? He asked nonchalantly without looking up from the faucet. Just a few hours today. I responded as we finished up and headed out of the bathroom side by side. He introduced himself as Frank with an outstretched hand that firmly gripped mine. His mention of being stuck behind a nasty accident down the road sparked an intriguing conversation that continued for some time. As we stood chatting in front of our rigs, we heard a loud commotion coming from around the corner near one of those dilapidated motels that seem to be abandoned yet are always occupied by some oddball character. What's going on over there? I asked curiously. Frank's demeanor shifted as a concerned expression clouded his face. I'm not sure, but I'm worried about my wife, Sarah. She runs the motel here, and sometimes she gets caught up in other people's problems. Let's go check it out. We hurried around to the motel's entrance and were confronted with a disheveled fellow, mid-thirties, clutching his shoulder while blood dripped down onto the pavement. What happened? Frank demanded nervously. The man stuttered in pain as he tried to find words. I was just going to my room when someone jumped me with a knife. As we scrambled to help him and find Sarah, we heard more shouts and screams echoing from rooms throughout the motel complex. The panic intensified as we realized that we were in the middle of an escalating act of terror. Frank and I sprinted towards Sarah's office, finding her assisting some blood-splattered guests who had been targeted by whoever was inflicting this undeserved wrath upon them. We quickly formed a plan, get everyone inside the office, lock the door, and call the police. As Frank guided people into their temporary sanctuary, I scanned around for any sign of who had caused this frenzy and came face to face with a man holding a blood-stained knife. His ice-cold eyes locked onto mine as he approached me like an animal stalking its prey. 
my body tensed, readying myself to fight back or make an evasive move if necessary. I instinctively started to back away, keeping my eyes on the knife-wielding man. Suddenly, Frank appeared beside me and threw an empty metal trash can at him, knocking him off balance. We took this chance to bolt for the office, slamming the door shut behind us just as the crazed attacker recovered and lunged in our direction. Inside the office, we barricaded the door with whatever objects we could find, chairs, a desk, anything, to keep that madman out. Somebody dialed 911 but was told that every available officer was already dealing with another incident several miles away. There would be a delay in response time. Frank, Sarah, and I discussed being anguished about what to do. We couldn't just throw ourselves at his mercy, but none of us was sure how to overpower such a deranged person. As we racked our brains for ideas, someone from the outside managed to retrieve a semi-automatic pistol from their truck. Maybe we can scare him off, offered Frank hesitantly. Sweat dripped from his face as he positioned himself by the door guns chattering in his nervous hands. Outside, we could hear the erratic footsteps of our attacker pacing back and forth. The next few minutes felt like an eternity, as everyone inside held their breath, praying for our unknown savior to arrive soon. Suddenly, with no warning and no seeming reason for doing so other than pure bloodlust, the assailant let out a gut-wrenching scream and began wildly stabbing at everything in sight. Walls, parked cars, even himself. Horrified by the gore but unwilling to open up the fortified door for fear of immersing themselves in the senseless chaos unfolding right outside their shelter, they were all trapped inside the office until outside help arrived. As agonizing minutes dragged by, one brave motel guest decided to venture out a window in search of reinforcements from another nearby rest stop. Finally, just as the sounds of carnage outside reached a fever pitch, police sirens echoed off the motel walls. Cautiously, the door was unbarred to reveal a team of officers pointing their firearms at the attacker, who now lay on the ground, viciously stabbing the earth with his knife. An officer approached us and said they had received a tip about an escaped fugitive named Alex Horton, who matched our description. He had been serving time for a string of brutal murders. Although injured by his self-inflicted wounds, Alex was still alive. Relieved but shaken by the night's events, we all gathered ourselves and mourned for those who didn't make it through. While waiting for the paramedics to arrive, Frank consoled Sarah in his arms as they sat among their broken possessions and blood-stained memories. The following day, I continued my drive to Detroit. Although I'd seen many grisly things in my life while driving cross-country, I couldn't shake what had happened at that motel. As I drove past the remains of what used to be a family-owned eatery, Demolished in one of Alex Horton's previous rampages, a sense of unease drowned my thoughts. Just like all those people at the motel forced to cross paths with evil far beyond their control, no one can predict when darkness might collide with their own lives. And no matter how far and hard we drive to shelter ourselves from tragedy and chaos, there's always another roadblock with terror hiding around its corner. It was a Thursday in mid-July of 1998 when I learned that my dead-end job as a truck driver could actually have a bit of excitement. Now, I don't mean excitement like winning the lottery or anything but excitement like the kind that makes your heart race and your hands slightly tremble. I was making my usual delivery to a small town in rural Illinois, 
population 753. Not exactly the most happening place on earth, but they needed their supplies just like everyone else. My rig was loaded with everything from canned goods to car parts for the local dealership. I remember passing by this towering silo on an old, worn-out farm when I first felt that something was off. The radio droned on about the hot summer weather and various events happening in towns nearby. There had been a series of break-ins recently, with burglars targeting small businesses during off hours. Mostly petty stuff, registers emptied out and small, easy-to-carry items stolen. The locals were getting freaked out, though. As soon as I pulled into the area behind Bob's Burger Shack, freshly painted bright red so it could be easily seen from the road, I swear two feelings hit me at once, uneasy anticipation and an even weirder sense of calmness. Brian Bellwether, the owner of Bob's Burger Shack, stepped out through the back door to greet me. Hey there! He shouted over the loud hum of my engine as I killed it. Thanks for getting here on time. We need those supplies before the Friday night rush. No problem, Brian, I replied. You know me, always prompt with deliveries. I began unloading boxes while Brian helped carry them into his restaurant. You have heard about all those break-ins? He asked, his voice full of dread. Yeah, I admitted. It had me feeling kind of antsy today. Well, he said nervously, it's got everyone in town on edge. Hell, I don't trust anyone I don't personally know anymore. As we finished moving everything, I saw a man across the street out of the corner of my eye. He was steadily gazing at Brian and me from behind the window of his beaten-up red pickup truck. Something about his demeanor alerted my instincts, but Brian just waved it away, saying he was a regular customer. Later, as I was leaving town, that guy in the red truck had somehow gotten ahead of me and was now trailing me, when before he had been nowhere in sight. And that wasn't the fact that made my hair stand on end. It was the blood-spattered windshield of his truck illuminated under the streetlights. The driver stared emotionlessly at me, some sinister intent seemingly growing within him. Suddenly, he left without warning, swerved his truck into the oncoming lane, and smashed into a small blue sedan. The sound of crunching metal combined with horrified screams filled my ears. I slammed on the brakes, panicking as the twisted wreckage came to rest not fifty feet from me. Without thinking, I jumped out of my car and ran to help. As I approached the wreckage, but before I could climb up to check on them, two other people from nearby houses ran up with similar intentions. Before any of us could react or help someone injured in a crash as sudden as this one, we noticed something unnerving. No one had crawled out or appeared hurt. All four doors were wide open, with no sign of an occupant. Bloodstains splattered against every surface of what used to be an ordinary car interior conveyed the eerie feeling that something hellishly gruesome had unfolded moments before. Our brains instantly linked this vehicle to those burglaries Brian mentioned earlier. The tension and fear boiled within us but really shot up when my brain registered a key detail. Either victim nor perpetrator seemed to be around. Heart thumping, I began scanning our surroundings, searching for any signs of them. A flicker of movement near an alley caught my attention as the group fanned out to look. The anticipation was debilitating. I managed to drag myself forward, inching toward what I hoped would not prove to be a terrifying mistake. If only I knew that it was just the beginning. As we ventured into the alley, our eyes tried to adjust to the darkness when suddenly a ragged gasp escaped from ahead. 
The four of us in the alley exchanged nervous looks and cautiously moved forward, following the direction of that ragged gasp. As we reached the end of the alley, we found the man from the red truck laying on the ground. He was battered and bruised and appeared to be barely alive. His body showed signs of a fierce struggle with someone or something far more vicious than we'd ever encountered. We debated calling for help, but in this small town where everyone was on edge after the break-ins, it seemed pointless. We thought about calling our co-workers or family members for assistance, but they wouldn't have any idea how to deal with a situation like this either. Hesitantly, one of the locals suggested that we bring him to his nearby house for safety and further evaluation. We all agreed it was better than leaving him out in the open as potential prey for whatever had attacked him in the first place. As we carried his battered body into the house, he whispered with a barely audible breath, The name is Victor Blakesley. Throughout the night, we took turns keeping watch over him and discussing what might have happened. It became clear that Victor Blakesley was not your typical burglar. His appearance alone was unnerving. He had thick, tangled hair and an intense look in his eyes that seemed to pierce through your very soul. He never spoke while committing his crimes, focusing solely on inflicting pain and terror on whoever stood in his way. The man's injury seemed consistent with an animal attack, deep gashes across his limbs and bite marks marring his flesh but we all knew that no animals in our area were capable of causing such carnage. As morning broke, we decided to dig deeper into who Victor Blakesley was and why he had terrorized our sleepy little town. We discovered he had a tragic past. He'd lost his wife and children in a fire a decade ago. The trauma and grief transformed him into a vengeful, ruthless person who took pleasure in inflicting harm upon others. The wounded man's condition didn't improve throughout the day, and we all gradually became more and more frightened by the prospect of Victor returning to finish what he'd started. We barricaded the doors and windows, preparing ourselves for an attack that may come at any moment. On the third day after our initial encounter with Victor, we were running low not only on food but also on hope. It seemed that we were trapped inside this house with no means of escape or help while a monster prowled the streets outside. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Stiffened, we stared at each other in fear. But it wasn't Victor. It was Brian Bellwether from Bob's Burger Shack. He'd grown increasingly worried about us not answering our phones and tracked us down based on where he last saw me heading. We explained our dire situation to Brian, who couldn't believe that someone he had casually waved to in town was responsible for such cruel acts. Setting aside his shock and disbelief, Brian became determined to assist us in confronting Victor. He suggested that we contact the authorities to work out a plan. His insistence on bringing them back into this situation reminded us that sometimes relying on others for support is essential. As we strategized with the police and waited for their arrival, something sinister unfolded outside. One of our group went missing during a run for supplies. The remaining three of us kept watch over the injured man while anxiously anticipating the arrival of reinforcements. When they arrived, we conducted a search for Victor together but found no trace of him or our missing friend. Although Victor Blakesley had momentarily vanished from sight, his presence forever loomed within our minds as a dark shadow over our once quiet town. Despite losing one of our own to an unknown fate at the hands of Victor, we knew that survival relied on our ability to support each other and stand strong in the face of terror. Victor Blakesley may not have been captured, 
but our resilience in the face of his relentless attacks was a testament to our unwavering spirit. Our story may not have had a satisfying conclusion, but we remained hopeful that one day we might finally witness an end to Victor's reign of terror and emerge victorious against our fears. It was one of those strikingly hot summer afternoons in June, the kind that makes you feel as if the sun was trying to scorch the very ground beneath your feet. I have been working as a truck driver for about five years now, hauling cargo across the United States. It was just another day on the job when I received my current assignment, pick up a shipment of electronics and deliver it to a warehouse in Reno, Nevada. I had made this trip dozens of times before, but for some reason that day felt different. As I loaded up my truck and hit the road, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that I was being watched. The thought began to eat away at me and forced me to look at everyone cautiously in my rearview mirror. The journey started out routinely enough, with miles upon miles of flat land blending into mountain ranges on the horizon. Somewhere along Interstate 80, about halfway to Reno, I decided to pull over at a truck stop for some much-needed food. As I stepped out of my rig into the searing heat, I scanned the area and saw a man standing near a group of trucks. He seemed oddly out of place. His clothing was tattered and covered in dirt. If it weren't for his constant pacing back and forth while muttering to himself, I might have mistaken him for just another homeless soul wandering aimlessly. But there was something about his appearance that unsettled me. His eyes seemed to be constantly shifting between two dark red orbs set deep into an unsettlingly gaunt face. As these thoughts raced through my mind, I entered the roadside diner and ordered myself some grub. While waiting for my meal, I couldn't help but glance out of the window from time to time, at which point, almost by chance, our eyes met the uneasy gaze causing me to shudder involuntarily. My meal arrived mercifully, so I forced my attention onto the food in front of me. Struggling to shake the man's visage from my head as I choked down a mediocre burger and fries, I couldn't help but feel as if I were about to make a horrible mistake. Ignoring my fear, I paid for my meal and decided to forge ahead with my delivery. I walked back to my truck, taking a different route, and was relieved to see the stranger had seemingly disappeared. The relief flooded over me as if a heavy weight had been effortlessly lifted away from me. Hoping that would be the last of it, I clambered into the cab of my truck and pulled back onto the highway in search of what lay ahead for me on this increasingly eventful trip. Hours went by without further cause for concern, but the sight of that unsettling stranger still haunted me. As darkness fell upon the open road, my radio buzzed with an announcement about an escapee from a nearby correctional facility. The news chilled me immensely. They described a dangerous man known for his love of violence and mutilation. According to the report, one of his more sinister acts involved burning homes with families still inside while he watched dispassionately from afar. The description matched that of the red-eyed stranger perfectly. My stomach twisted into knots as fear continued to grip me tighter than ever. Before long, passing headlights illuminated something on the side of the road that made my blood run colder than ice water. There was blood spattered across the asphalt beside a smoldering wreck of two vehicles mashed together in a cacophony of twisted metal. But what really troubled me was not just the fact that there were no emergency services in sight yet, but rather how strangely familiar it all was. I screeched to halt, 
issuing up a wild dust cloud pushed forward by adrenaline and fear coursing through me, slamming open my door and stepping out cautiously into the frigid night air. I cautiously approached the wreckage, my heart pounding. The gruesome sight of the mutilated bodies scattered across the road was horrifying. I quickly fumbled for my phone and dialed 911, only to realize it was dead. Panic set in as I became painfully aware that there was no way for me to call for help. Just then, a truck pulled up behind me, the driver stepping out onto the desolate highway. His face was twisted with concern as he took in the surrounding carnage. What happened here? He asked in a shaky voice. I don't know, I replied. I saw the wreckage and stopped to help, but my phone's dead. I'll call for help, he said, taking out his own phone. As he dialed emergency services, I couldn't help but notice a subtle red gleam in his eyes. My pulse quickened as I realized that this man bore an uncanny resemblance to the stranger I'd seen at the truck stop earlier. Could this be the escaped convict? I tried to push those thoughts out of my mind as we waited for help to arrive. After what felt like an eternity, police cars and ambulances swarmed the scene. Officers questioned us about what we had witnessed while paramedics tended to any survivors they could find amidst the devastation. The authorities instructed us to leave while they investigated further. As we went our separate ways, a strange sense of foreboding overcame me, but I knew that I had no choice but to continue toward Reno. The unnerving images of the wreckage and the possible connection between it all and my fellow truck driver weighed heavily on my mind as I continued through the darkness. Upon reaching Reno and unloading my cargo at the warehouse, my nerves were on edge. The haunting sensation of being watched still lingered as I made my way back to my rig. A moment's hesitation struck me before climbing into the cab and I was overwhelmed by a sudden urge to check the back of my trailer. As I swung open the doors, the sight that greeted me left me speechless. There, bound and gagged, were a number of people, beaten, bloodied, and barely alive. The horrifying truth struck me like a bolt of lightning. The driver who had stopped to help me on the highway was undoubtedly responsible for their suffering. The escaped prisoner's evil intentions had been just under my nose the entire time. Distraught, I realized that I had never caught his name during our brief conversation at the scene of the accident. I needed to report him to the authorities immediately, but had nothing more than his menacing red eyes to go on. As luck would have it, an officer came to take a statement— and after relaying my suspicions about the other driver, he finally confirmed his identity. The man's name was Asa Griggs, the wanted murderer whose brutal crimes had instilled fear in people's hearts wherever he went. Knowing that he was out there somewhere was chilling, but I took comfort in knowing that I had helped bring his horrifying acts to light. The victims found in my trailer were taken in by emergency services for medical treatment and counseling. Though they had suffered through unspeakable trauma at the hands of Griggs, I felt a small sense of relief that they now had a chance at survival. As for Asa Griggs, his fate still remains unknown. The man escaped into the night as quickly as he'd appeared leaving behind a twisted scene that will forever haunt me. No one knows where he is now or what horrors he might be perpetrating upon his unsuspecting victims, an eerie reminder that evil lurks beneath many deceptive facades we may encounter in our lives. I was driving my usual truck route along the winding roads of West Virginia when it happened. 
The date was September 4, 2008, a seemingly ordinary day with blue skies overhead and not a single hint of anything unusual or eerie. I remember listening to the radio, trying to catch my favorite talk show that day, and thinking about how their attempt at humor was laughable. I pulled off onto a rest stop area. Maybe one of those greasy roadside burger joints wasn't such a terrible idea after all. But before I even got there, a rumble of thunder shook me out of my light-hearted musings. Surprised by the sudden shift in weather, I squinted out the windshield just in time to catch a glimpse of something unsettling. There it was again, that erratic movement I noticed earlier on the highway when I stopped for mandatory inspection. Like shards of seemingly disjointed glass twisting and contorting in darkness. It gave me the creeps like someone scratching their nails on a blackboard. As I returned to my truck to resume driving, catastrophe struck. My engine refused to start. I tried multiple times but couldn't get it going again. Frowning and cursing under my breath, I pulled out my phone and dialed my good old friend Steve, a fellow trucker himself, to give me pointers on any possible quick fixes. Suddenly, there was a knock on the passenger door, loud enough to make me jump. Tapping on the window with an anxious expression was a middle-aged woman in a coat that seemed too large for her small frame. She asked if she could hop in for the ride. Her car was further down the road with smoke billowing out from its hood. Despite my own troubles, I reluctantly agreed to help her out after listening to her reasoning safety in numbers and all that comforting jazz. As she climbed in, she introduced herself as Janine, a freelance photographer driving through the countryside looking for her next big shot. Janine and I were discussing some mundane topics when terror struck in waves. We heard thudding sounds from behind, which seemed to be growing closer. Our hearts raced, and our palms grew clammy as the relentless sounds continued. It was sludge-like and wet, combined with what almost seemed like grunts and heavy breathing. Before we knew it, there was a large man dressed in all black standing not far from our truck. His face was in shadows, but we could make out a twisted smile that sent shivers through our core. He was covered with what seemed to be thick slabs of red gore, causing Janine to shudder at the sight. The man advanced toward us slowly, each step deliberate and menacing. As we fumbled with the doors to keep him at bay, it dawned on both Janine and me just what terrible danger we were in. The impending doom was palpable, hanging heavy like an oppressive fog. I tried frantically to start my engine once more, praying for a miracle amid this nightmarish disaster. With each attempt, I desperately urged the truck to come back to life even as the man continued inching ever so slowly towards us. Janine screamed, pleading for him to stop approaching, her voice strained with terror never known before, but he didn't flinch or hesitate. Glancing over at her again revealed new bruises decorating her pale neck and face, a horrifying sign of the antagonist's relentless pursuit. Finally, whether by miracle or sheer luck, the engine roared back to life. The sudden noise startled Janine and me enough for us both to delay accelerating forward for a moment too long. In the nick of time, I floored the gas pedal and the truck lurched forward. The large man in black was left in the dust as we sped down the road, our hearts pounding in relief. But that was short-lived. The truck's engine stopped with a sudden jolt, and we pulled over to the shoulder. I suspected some unseen force caused it. How could this night get any worse? Janine and I exchanged glances realizing that help had to be called. 
Despite our fear of attracting attention from the ominous man back there, we were stranded without any other options. Trembling, Janine managed to dial 911 and provide our location. She hesitated to mention details about our pursuer. It was far beyond belief and hard to describe what he really was. As we waited for assistance, we puddled together inside the cabin of the truck. It wasn't long before we heard that dreadful splatting sound again, like someone slowly walking through mud mixed with stone-cold dread. He was back. We watched in horror as his gore-covered form slowly became visible under the moonlight, drawing closer with every step. His intentional approach made this even more unbearable. He knew we were trapped. With failed escape attempts playing through my mind, fresh panic set in when I remembered a crowbar I had stored somewhere under my seat. Desperate to use anything to defend ourselves if he reached us, I grabbed it, already expecting Janine to disapprove. She didn't. Instead, she nodded frantically as if understanding that this would be our last hope for survival. The attacker continued his slow advance until we saw him clearly, a tall man drenched in blood, his face distorted by an unsettling smile that seemed almost stitched on permanently. With a crowbar clenched tightly in my grip and determination burning through my veins, I braced myself while Janine used her phone's flash to make sure we could see. I swung the crowbar wildly, hitting him square on the jaw, a sickening crunch cutting through the night air. Janine screamed when he staggered back but didn't fall, instead inching toward us once more despite the wound we'd inflicted. Our panic grew immeasurably as my efforts to incapacitate him did nothing. Tires screeched in the distance, police sirens blaring closer as moments passed. The attacker stopped and seemed to contemplate his next move. Then, without warning, he vanished into the darkness just as help arrived, leaving Janine and me cold and trembling in the truck. The police took our statements but seemed doubtful about our claims concerning the man's abilities and his insistence on stalking us both. They added that it sounded too fictional a regular story embellished into horror fiction. Instead, they chalked it up to chance encounters with a deranged man-man we had luckily escaped from before any fatal consequences. Collapsing onto my lounge once back home, I found a discarded leather wallet lying next to my crowbar. It must have flown off our attacker during the scuffle. Inside was an ID card revealing that he was a man named Victor from Colorado. The name sounded familiar, but I couldn't quite place why. It gnawed at my thoughts long after I had reported my findings to the authorities. A few days later, while nursing a coffee at a truck stop diner, Janine called with chilling news. Victor wasn't any ordinary man-man. He was an escaped convict with blood on his hands and a vendetta against those who crossed his path. The local media buzzed with speculation about his whereabouts, and as I listened further, I realized that our ordeal was far from over. Knowing our peace was temporary certainly dampened any hopes for living without fear of further action or retaliation. It brought our memories of that dreadful night racing back in full force. We still couldn't shake the unnerving feeling that he lurked around every corner, watching and waiting for his moment to strike again. In the end, my only hope was that one day, when least expected, I would hear about Victor's ultimate capture and our lives could return to whatever semblance of normal we had left. But until then... Everything remained uncertain and unsettling. There's something about driving on those endless, 
narrow highways that can induce near-hypnotic states. I've been a truck driver for over a decade now, and there's an almost magical quality to those lonely stretches of asphalt, especially in the late hours of the night. It was around 3.37 a.m. when I found myself navigating the twisting curves of Arizona State Route 89A. With every turn and sway of my rig, broken only by the occasional squawk of my trusty radio, I could feel the miles of pavement both behind and ahead seeming to merge as one. I'd pulled into a small gas station situated right between the towering red rocks on my left that seemed to dwarf me and my rig, the comforting glow of its neon sign cutting through the inky darkness. I stepped out, stretching my weary limbs as I reached for my wallet. The faint sound of laughter caught my attention. A group of college kids huddled around one of those old, beaten up pickup trucks that had clearly seen better days. I paid for my diesel, picked up a stale cup of coffee, as black as the night outside, and proceeded toward my big rig. That's when I noticed something unusual. It seemed as if shadows were creeping up the sides of the imposing rock formations nearby, as if being slowly devoured by an unseen force cast in shades darker than darkness itself. I shook it off as a result of a lack of sleep and fantasies caused by spending too much time on these desolate roads. As I climbed back into my cab and shifted into gear, the sensation intensified a malicious presence lurking just beyond these rocks. Despite telling myself it was all in my head, my grip on the wheel tightened. The drive progressed without incident. However, an undeniable sense of dread loomed heavy within me. The radio signal started to waver now and then, as it tends to do in areas like this, without warning. After a few hours, the landscape changed, giving way to expansive forests. The moonlight filtering through the tall pines painted eerie silhouettes across the road. As I approached a sharp curve, I caught a glimpse of what appeared to be a man, a middle-aged man with an unkempt beard and dirt-streaked clothes, standing close to the edge of the highway. He was staring blankly ahead, not bothering to acknowledge my truck as it thundered by him. I slowed down beside him and tapped on the horn. Hey, buddy! Need any help? I shouted through the open window. The man seemed almost shocked by my sudden appearance. He hesitated for a moment before slowly shaking his head and muttering something I couldn't quite hear. I figured that he was probably intoxicated or just someone who wanted to be alone, and driven by an unexplainable urge to maintain some distance from him, I continued my journey. A mile or so down the road, that feeling resurfaced, now intermingled with inexplicable guilt, as if there was some connection between my passing encounter with that strange individual. With each passing mile, it felt as if a shadowy presence was steadily creeping closer and closer to my tail. And then it happened. In my rearview mirror, far off in the distance behind me, it was him. The bearded man I had passed earlier somehow managed to keep pace with my speeding rig. His expression twisted into what could only be described as a malevolent grin as he began closing in on me at an unnatural speed that seemed impossible, given the condition he was in earlier. Suddenly overwhelmed by panic and desperation, I slammed my foot down on the accelerator pedal even harder, defying the limits of safety for myself and anyone else who might have been unfortunate enough to be on these roads at this hour. My truck roared down the road, but no matter how fast I went, the bearded man appeared to gain on me, maintaining his sinister grin. Panic gripped me as the radio signal cut out entirely, leaving me with only my thoughts and the echoing sound of the engine. 
The realization that I needed assistance struck. Who could help? A flicker of hope ignited within me as I recalled those college kids from earlier at the gas station. Maybe they knew something or had a way to help. Heavy breathing filled the cab as I managed to pull out my phone. Hands trembling, I dialed the emergency number, hoping someone could advise me on what to do next. But when my call connected, all that greeted me was silence, followed by a disconnection tone. My heart sank as I tried again, with no success. What choice did I have but to keep driving? The bearded man drew ever closer, and I turned onto a small road leading into a dense forest. Perhaps it would offer some advantage. The branches scraped against the truck like skeletal fingers reaching for their prey. I spotted a nearby ranger station just off the road and desperately steered my rig towards it, praying to find someone there who could help. As I screeched to a halt right outside its entrance, I could see that the once-occupied station was now abandoned, ravaged by time and neglect. Determined not to give up, I searched for any signs of life or helpful information. A dusty bulletin board hung precariously on one wall, where I found an article detailing a series of grisly attacks in these very woods by someone only known as the Red Rock Stalker, described as a middle-aged man with an unkempt beard and dirt-streaked clothes. Dread nodded in my stomach as I realized that this man was my tormentor, the one who had been chasing me relentlessly across the highway all night long. I had stumbled into his territory and was now hopelessly ensnared in it. A cacophony of twisted laughter erupted from behind me as the bearded man burst through the station door, his malicious grin now entirely consuming his face. I lunged for the truck keys, ready to flee this horror scene, only to find that they had vanished. I could do nothing but watch in disbelief as the man held up my keys between his filthy fingers taunting me with his cold, dead eyes. Slowly, he covered the distance between us, and I braced myself for the inevitable violence that awaited me. But it never came. Instead, he stopped at arm's length and dangled the keys just above my reach, as if he wanted me to give chase once again. I hesitated at first but ultimately decided against it. I sprang towards him, swiping the keys from his hand and making a break toward my truck. As quickly as I could, I shoved the key into the ignition and turned it with fervor. Miraculously, my rig roared to life just as the red rock stalker slammed into its side. With a roar of my own, I put my foot down on the accelerator and surged forward leaving him writhing in pain and fury in my dust. The truck rumbled through those dark woods, with only mile markers indicating where I might find some semblance of safety. Though shaken by what transpired, constant glances over my shoulder proved that he hadn't returned. Relief washed over me, for now, at least. In those final moments before sunrise, I caught a glimpse of those same college kids from earlier at another gas station down the road. They must have also encountered the Red Rock Stalker but managed to escape unscathed. We shared a knowing glance, as if bound together by our shared experience. Each time I catch myself glancing at those towering red rocks dotting the landscape, or traveling along that ominous highway in the late hours of the night, memories of that terrible night and haunting figure will forever linger, a reminder that sometimes sheer determination is the only way to stay one step ahead. My everyday life has been an endless routine for years, no different from any other truck driver across the United States. 
I'm just a regular guy doing regular things. You wouldn't expect something out of the ordinary to happen to someone like me. But it did. It was in Jackson, Mississippi, during a regular run between Memphis and New Orleans. I had a cup of coffee at a cozy little diner that I regularly visited. A friendly local joked about the way northerners talk, and I laughed it off as good-natured banter. Life was simple and honestly kind of monotonous. That evening, I parked my truck in my regular spot near a rest area and prepared for another night in my sleeper cab. An eerie calm hung in the air that night, which made me feel somewhat uneasy, a feeling I hadn't experienced before. Before calling it a night, I stepped outside to take a final gulp of fresh air and stretch my legs one last time. It was largely abandoned, aside from an old sedan parked under the dimly lit street lamp with a couple arguing a few feet away. Just as I was about to head back to my truck, something caught my eye on the edge of the tree lean. A man, at least six feet tall and visibly muscular, stood there, watching me with narrowed eyes. He wore a jacket with patches that seemed almost purposefully disoriented. His face was shrouded under a wide-brimmed cowboy hat but had an unsettling smirk that sent chills down my spine. With each step closer to my truck, he mirrored me, maintaining his distance but never taking his gaze off of me. I quickly climbed into my rig and locked all the doors before putting all the curtains up for added security. My heartbeat pounded in my ears as I lay in bed, trying to comprehend what had just happened. Every fiber of my being told me to leave. So at the crack of dawn, I fired up the engine and hit the road. As I was pulling out of the parking lot, I glanced at the tree lean one last time and saw that I wasn't being pursued, but my instincts told me that this wasn't over. Over the next few days, I felt a constant sense of unease that followed me like a shadow. It seemed as if I were being haunted by that man from the tree lean. I couldn't shake the paranoia. One evening, during a stop in Birmingham, Alabama, I met an older gentleman who introduced himself as a fellow trucker named Tom. He shared a story with me about how he once encountered a sinister individual on the road who terrorized him for months before vanishing without a trace. Our conversation left me with an even deeper sense of dread. Finally, my fears became reality when I reached Montgomery for a fuel stop. While checking my oil levels in between fueling, out of the corner of my eye, there he was, the man from Jackson, standing near an old pickup truck, still wearing that menacing smirk. The most unsettling part was that nobody seemed to notice him or his intentions. As panic rose within me, those final moments of our encounter in Jackson replayed in my mind like a glitchy recording. I hiked up into my cab and hightailed it out of there as fast as company policy allowed. The next week turned into a living nightmare, random, untraceable phone calls to my dispatcher asking about my routes, odd packages addressed to me in random mailboxes left open on seemingly deserted streets, whispers at truck stops that felt too close for comfort, all instances getting more intense every time. My life turned from monotonous to dreadful overnight. It felt like my own personal horror film unfolding before my very eyes, one scene at a time. Finally making it back to Memphis on yet another run between Baton Rouge and Nashville, I felt completely drained by the experiences over the past few weeks. Every face I encountered appeared like a twisted version of the sinister man. I couldn't help but suspect everyone I met. That dark and quiet evening, after a meager meal at a 24-hour diner, I retraced the steps back to my truck, dreading what could come next. In that parking lot, 
there was not a soul to be found. The air was thick with tension as my heartbeat thudded through my body like a desperate SOS call. I decided it was time to act. I needed to find and confront this man who had invaded my existence, slipping in between the small routines that made up my life. It was worth a shot if it meant getting back to my normalcy. I started asking around truck stops, showing people a sketch of the man's face. Most people shook their heads and insisted they'd never seen him before. But one older woman stared at the image for a moment before revealing that she recognized the man. His name was Dean, and apparently... He had some sort of twisted history with truck drivers, terrorizing them and destroying their lives as if it were a grotesque game. The next day, I found myself parked in an abandoned warehouse parking lot where Dean was rumored to frequent. I waited inside my truck, gripping a tire iron that I planned to use in case things turned physical. Late into the night, I saw him emerge from the shadows, his tall frame looming as he first approached cautiously before seeing my truck. His eyes gleamed maliciously as he prepared to descend on his prey. As he neared my vehicle, I silently got out through the driver's side door. I crept up behind him and swung the tire iron with all my strength at his unsuspecting head. The impact created a sickening thud mixed with the crunch of metal meeting bone. Dean fell motionless to the ground. Blood spread slowly from under his form, but he still breathed shallowly, alive but clearly disoriented. What do you want from me? I screamed at him, my voice breaking with frustration and fear. Without uttering a word or regaining consciousness, a blood-stained smile traced over Dean's lips. Mystified by his silence, I searched his jacket pockets until I found a crumpled piece of paper that contained details about me, my full name, family members' names, truck route information, everything. It felt like a gut punch, the sheer intensity of the invasion of my privacy. I called the police and they took Dean into custody, assuring me that he would not get away with his deeds. As the days wore on, I found out that his previous victims had been found dead, brutally killed in locations spread throughout Mississippi and Alabama. Sleep still didn't come easy for me after everything, but I couldn't help but feel grateful to be alive. One day, when I returned to my truck after a routine delivery, I discovered an envelope filled with more disturbing details, this time about other truck drivers whom I suspected were targeted by Dean or his accomplices. I made a difficult decision. Every driver deserved a right to know if they were in danger. Tracking each one down in person became my mission. But as the weeks passed, Letters continued to mysteriously show up in my sleeper cab. I started to wonder if Dean was more like a twisted idea or some sort of obsession that had been passed between criminal minds than just an isolated antagonist. The line between victim and accomplice seemed blurred as each person I reached out to began experiencing strange occurrences similar to mine. A year has elapsed since those events unfolded. The phantom letters have ceased for now. But still, whenever I stop at an unfamiliar truck lot and an unfamiliar vehicle parks near mine, silent trepidation grips at my heart. It was one of those idyllic summer afternoons when everyone seemed to have shed their worries, and the world looked as colorful as a postcard. My name is Jack, and I'm a truck driver by profession. With the warm sun guiding my way, I drove my 18-wheeler past rolling green pastures, humming a cheerful little tune as I went. 
My destination was a rural town in Nebraska because I had a pickup scheduled there. As I rolled into town, I noticed an elderly man walking alongside the road with a cane. He raised his hand for help, and being the good Samaritan I am, and to flex my wit, I stopped and asked, Hey sir, do you need some wheels? The old man smiled and climbed into my truck with great difficulty. We exchanged pleasantries as we headed towards his house on the outskirts of town. Along the journey, he reminisced about the colorful characters he had encountered in his youth. One character stood out, a man called Pete's Shadow, who was rumored to roam the woods after sundown. I couldn't help but laugh at this supposed shadowy figure lurking in the peaceful countryside. You folks need better hobbies, I joked. The old man chuckled and replied, Well, son, sometimes tales keep people safe from things they shouldn't be meddling with. We finally reached the old man's home, a cozy yellow house that looked like it belonged in a painting. As he got down from my truck, I saw him wince in pain. His deteriorating health made me wonder how he managed to live in this isolated area. Over the next few days, while driving back and forth within this picturesque little town, it was hard not to feel insulated from all the troubles of urban life. However, that deceptive sense of security was soon shattered. Just before dusk one day, as I drove near a dense patch of woods, I saw a man emerge from the trees and walk towards the road. He was tall, lanky, and undeniably unkempt. His clothes were dirty and torn, and his disheveled hair hung around his gaunt face like seaweed draping off a sunken ship. An eerie calmness surrounded him as he stood by the roadside and I instinctively knew that offering him a ride would not be wise. Instead, I accelerated my truck and sped as far away from him as possible. By the time I reached the nearest gas station, my heart was pounding wildly in my chest. Something about the man's deep-set eyes had unsettled me to my core. While refueling my truck, I asked the attendant if he had ever seen a man like that around. The attendant quizzically questioned my description before slowly shaking his head. I could tell that his curiosity was piqued now, though. As we continued chatting, an unnerving thought crept into my mind. Was this strange character somehow connected to those folk tales surrounding Pete's shadow? Having delivered my cargo for the day, I started driving back to the motel where I was staying. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting a sinister pall over everything. And it began. That lurking feeling of dread intensified with each passing mile, as if that ghastly figure were right behind me. Before long, erratic noises resounded in the distance, scratching tires, muffled screams, adding to my pounding headache. The situation quickly spiraled into chaos as a whole slew of peculiar events transpired around me. The road ahead seemed eerily deserted. The flickering streetlights offer no comfort, while each bend in the road promised dreadful encounters. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a blood-soaked body sprawled on the pavement just ahead of me. As I swerved hard to avoid it, and slammed on the brakes with sweat pouring down my face. The bloodied figure on the road left me paralyzed with terror. With my hands gripping the steering wheel, it suddenly struck me, is this the handiwork of Pete's shadow, a demented psychopath inflicting pain and fear upon unsuspecting victims? Was he hunting again? Had I become his next target? I knew I couldn't just sit and wait for what was to come. I quickly realized that I needed to gather more information about this mysterious individual. With hesitance, I picked up my phone and dialed the number of the old man I had met a few days earlier. To my relief, 
he answered promptly. Listen, I said nervously. I think I might have come across this Pete's shadow you mentioned. Is there any way you can help me figure out what to do next? Well, he replied slowly, I suggest you go to the local sheriff's station. They should have records on such incidents and maybe even a clue about Pete's shadow. Without wasting any time, I drove straight to the sheriff's office. The officer at the front desk listened intently as I recounted my encounter with the strange man by the woods and shared my suspicions about his connection to Pete's shadow. He then escorted me to their archives, where we scoured old newspaper clippings and files for any pertinent information. Finally, we stumbled upon an article from twenty years ago detailing a string of gruesome attacks in the woods around town. The victims had been left with deep lacerations, their bodies mangled in unnatural positions. The attacker was eventually dubbed Pete's Shadow, due to his elusive nature and lack of evidence pointing to a human perpetrator. The officer looked at me gravely. Your encounter lines up with these attacks, he said. He has never been caught or identified. But if it is indeed Pete's shadow that you saw, you're fortunate to have escaped unharmed. I decided then not to call anybody else for help. Doing so might spread panic in town or expose more people to this dangerous threat. Instead, I resolved to keep an eye out for any suspicious activity and report it immediately. After leaving the sheriff's office, I decided to confront the old man who had first told me about Pete's shadow. When I arrived at his house, I asked him why, after all this time, Pete's shadow continued to harm people. The old man sighed and explained that, according to legend, Pete's shadow was once a man named Peter who, tormented by his own dark past, sought to inflict pain on others as a twisted form of solace. Unable to come to terms with his actions or find peace in life, he now haunted the woods, unable to fully leave the world behind. That night, as I lay in bed at the motel, I couldn't shake the chilling encounter from my thoughts. Foolishly brave and unable to sleep, I decided to drive past the woods where I saw the man earlier. Perhaps the horror would subside if I confronted it head-on. As if sensing my presence, Pete's shadow appeared in my headlights beam with blood-stained hands and a macabre grin etched on his face. My pulse raced, and instinct screamed for me to escape before becoming another one of his victims. But inexplicably reaching for my steering wheel lock instead of the ignition key, I decided to face him down, in the only way that felt right for me. I slowly stepped out of my truck as Pete's shadow stood still, staring at me coldly through hollow eyes. His creepiness intensified as each second passed. In a flurry of movement fueled by raw determination not experienced before in my life, I swung the steering wheel lock with all my might. The impact left him dazed but still standing. He was no mere mortal man. Seeing that my attack did little damage prompted me to quickly retreat back into my truck and flee the scene at breakneck speed. As the figure grew smaller in my rearview mirror, a sense of relief washed over me, but I knew this wouldn't be our last encounter. Now more than ever before, I believe Pete's shadow walks among us. A ghastly reminder that darkness and fear lurk even in the most idyllic of places. My encounter with him has left me scarred but wiser, knowing that evil awaits to prey on the unsuspecting. Be careful out there. Pete's shadow could be watching, waiting to torment his next victim.
I was cursing under my breath as I navigated some narrow back alley near Boston's Fenway Park, trying to find a place to park my truck. Being a truck driver can be a real pain sometimes, especially when you have to deal with city traffic and tight spaces. Dealing with overbearing and demanding clients is just the cherry on top. While attempting a particularly difficult three-point turn, I accidentally bumped into an old steel trash bin, causing it to rattle unpleasantly. Great. Just what I needed. As I got out of the truck to assess any damage, I heard the faint sound of glass shattering a little further down the alley. I'm not a nosy person by nature, but something about that sound just didn't sit right with me. Maybe it was the eerily quiet night, or maybe it was the jarring contrast between my noisy collision and the almost delicate tinkle of broken glass. Whatever it was, I couldn't resist inspecting it. As I followed where the noise came from, I came upon a small building next to an abandoned construction site. There were pieces of shattered glass on the ground near the window. It was clear this wasn't an accident. The window had been broken inwardly forcefully by someone or something. As much as I wanted to get back to my truck and forget about this eerie detour, curiosity got the better of me. With equal parts trepidation and recklessness, I cautiously stepped across the threshold and glanced around the dimly lit room. The room itself looked like some kind of storage area for building materials. Bricks, cement bags, and rusty tools were scattered randomly across dusty wooden floors. The musty smell assaulted my nostrils immediately, as if that place hadn't seen human contact in years. There was no power in this building either. Every step stirred up more dust particles in my flashlight's beam. Then, faintly above me in the rickety stairwell, I heard the sound of heavy breathing. I mustered the courage to climb the stairs, trying my best to be as quiet as possible. As I reached the top landing, I saw a huddled figure pressed tightly against a moldy wall. There was something uncanny about them. They were barely recognizable as humans at first glance. Their clothes were tattered and filthy, and they emitted a stench that made me gag. My heart raced in my chest as I took a step back in terror. The figure's head snapped up to reveal a face that was twisted with agony and malice. His eyes looked unnaturally wide and wild, as if he were experiencing an emotion too powerful for any sane person to endure. He lunged toward me suddenly with astonishing speed and unnatural agility, his eyes unblinking as they locked onto mine. Instinctively, I recoiled in horror, but his hand shot out and latched onto my wrist before I could even think about escaping. Sheer panic fueled my strength as I wrenched my arm away from his grasp and practically catapulted myself back down the stairs. My panicked footsteps echoed throughout the abandoned building, but they were quickly drowned out by his frenzied pursuit. Adrenaline coursed through me as my breathing became ragged. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to keep running at all costs. I kicked open the door and stumbled out of the building onto the dimly lit alleyway outside. Desperation forced me to sprint faster than I had ever run before, but behind me, I could hear him gaining ground with alarming speed. The heart-pounding chase felt endless as I zigzagged through seemingly endless alleyways and streets, my lungs burning and my legs on the verge of giving out. Finally, like some twisted miracle, my truck came into view again. The recognizable shape of it promised safety, if only I could make it there in time. The frenzied footsteps behind me were growing closer, every ragged breath carrying the terrifying knowledge that he was zeroing in on his prey. Gasping for breath and my legs aching with exhaustion, I fumbled frantically for my keys 
my hands shaking from terror. Ignoring the pain in my legs, I managed to unlock and open my truck. The moment the door opened, I scrambled into the vehicle, shaking hands, slamming the door shut, and locking it in one swift motion. The sound of the lock clicking into place felt like a momentary reprieve from my terrifying ordeal. I stared out of the window, my heart pounding, as I saw the twisted figure approach. He was covered in filth, with patches of grime-blackened skin exposed through his ragged clothing. His wild eyes seemed to burn with hatred as he stood outside, clutching a piece of sharp, jagged glass in his hand. He skillfully brandished that makeshift weapon as he started crashing it against the door of the truck, connecting inches away from my face. Amid all that chaos, my thoughts raced through the reasons why I didn't call for help. I was too terrified, too focused on staying alive, to take out my phone or cry out for aid. Desperate to escape this nightmare, I frantically tried to start the engine. Once it roared to life, I quickly accelerated the truck onto the main road, tires screeching and honking furiously at anyone crossing my path. As if driven by innate fury or madness, he chased after me but gradually disappeared in my rearview mirror. Finally, feeling a sense of temporary safety, I stopped by a nearby convenience store to gather myself and report what transpired to local law enforcement. When an officer arrived at the scene to take my statement, he asked me multiple questions about the assailant's features and his behavior. Days later, during a follow-up visit with police investigators, they told me they had found several mutilated animals in that abandoned building, gruesome proof that this deranged individual had inflicted gruesome pain on innocent creatures. They also mentioned that they believed they had identified the antagonist, an escaped convict named Terry, who had been institutionalized years ago for his violent tendencies and erratic behavior. It was clear he had managed to hide his true identity from the city by lurking in its forgotten corners. Investigators assured me that their team was working diligently and had been monitoring recent cases of missing beggars and homeless individuals around the area, theorizing that Terry may have been involved. They warned me to be cautious, as it was apparent that Terry remained focused on causing death and destruction without remorse. In the following days, I grew increasingly paranoid of every shadow and movement, constantly looking behind me as I carried out my daily routine. I couldn't shake the feeling that those haunting eyes were still stalking me, waiting for another chance to strike. As I struggled to find some semblance of peace, I found solace in knowing Terry's dangerous past had caught up with him, but also in recognizing that he remained at large evading capture. The realization that I just might come face to face with him again left an eerie chill lingering over my daily life. And in my most vulnerable moments, when dread threatened to wring every ounce of courage from my soul, my mind wandered back to that horrific scene in the abandoned building, a harrowing reminder of the terror and depravity one person could inflict upon others. And so I lived with the knowledge that no matter where I went or what precautions I took, a malevolent force, nameless no more, seemed hellbent on leaving a trail of bloodshed in its wake. And as Terry continued to elude capture, the city turned into a hunting ground where predators stalked their prey under the cover of darkness. The atmosphere was transfixed by an unspoken tension a gloomy reminder of evil's presence lurking among us. It was one of those days that felt like a chapter straight out of my life, unfortunate yet worth remembering. 
I've always considered myself to be a straightforward, nothing special kind of guy who happens to drive a truck for a living. While on the job, I experienced some strange things, but nothing came close to that unnerving encounter on Route 20 in Alabama. My day had started like any other. Everything seemed as normal as could be. I grabbed tiny donuts and black coffee from the gas station before carrying on with my usual route. You could say there was some comfort in the mundane routine. My truck growled as I turned the key, bringing it back to life. A few hours into the drive, I came across an accident scene. Police officers were directing traffic around an overturned vehicle. They waved me through with stoic expressions. The car was a wreck, and though I couldn't see everything in detail, it seemed like everyone involved had made it out alive. Before long, the scene behind me faded off into the distance as I continued down the highway. By the time evening rolled around, I found myself gazing at an extraordinary sunset painted across the horizon while getting lost in an engaging crime podcast, a guilty pleasure of mine. As darkness fell, I pulled over at the Bear Creek rest stop for much-needed food and coffee to keep me going through the night. Back on the road, my thoughts wandered when my headlights caught something odd on the shoulder up ahead. It appeared to be a man standing by his car, which had smoke billowing from beneath its hood. Being a decent guy and all, I instinctively felt compelled to help him out. As I approached him cautiously, you never know these days what type of person you're dealing with. He turned towards me, revealing a face cloaked with shadows and rugged scruffiness. He wore dirty jeans and a stained jacket that had seen better days. He didn't say anything at first, nor did he seem overjoyed to see me, but I shrugged it off and inquired about the state of his car. With a heavy southern accent, he muttered that the engine had overheated and he'd been waiting for his buddy to return with a tow truck. As we waited... I happened to glance at the side of his car and realized the door had deep scratches and smeared blood stains, making me question what on earth I had just involved myself in. Things took an even darker turn when we heard distant gunshots. My new acquaintance's ears perked up as he darted towards the wooded area adjacent to the road with surprising speed. He began shouting incoherently with this wild look on his face that made me question whether I should stick around or make a beeline back to my truck. The situation spiraled out of control when a series of blood-curdling screams echoed through the night air, followed by more gunfire loaded with panic. The sound belonged to someone else who had been taken by surprise, although it was impossible for me to tell who was shooting whom. The blood and suspense built up in waves as my adrenaline pumped and my heart pounded in my chest. The darkness seemed to intensify as though it were deliberate, suffocating everything that was familiar. Neither trusting nor understanding my position in this chaos, I felt an overwhelming need to flee from this sickening scene and put as much distance between me and this gruesome affair as possible. As I made my decision to leave the scene, I bolted back to my truck as quickly as I could. The air was thick, making it difficult for me to breathe, and it felt like an eternity before I reached my truck. Once inside, I locked the doors and attempted to calm myself down. After examining the situation, I decided that it would be best to call for help instead of trying to handle this on my own. I fumbled in my pocket for my phone and dialed 911, explaining to the operator that there was potential danger off Route 20 in Alabama at a car breakdown site. They informed me that the police would be dispatched immediately. Sitting there in the driver's seat of my truck, no longer hearing the gunfire or screams, doubt began to seep into my mind. 
Was what I just experienced actually real? Maybe it was simply a figment of my imagination, fueled by my crime podcast addiction. Resolute in leaving that place behind me, I put the truck in gear and drove off into the night. I continued my route as planned, even though apprehension followed me all the way. It wasn't until a few days later that a friend of mine called with unexpected news. She had seen an article about a man named Cyril, who turned out to be an escaped convict with a record of violent behavior. He took people captive in the woods off Route 20, among other heinous crimes. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This man had been right before me in plain sight when I stopped at that car breakdown site. It sent shivers down my spine, knowing just how close I'd come to such immense danger. The news article mentioned that the police found evidence of these violent acts near the overturned vehicle where Cyril had been standing amidst smoke just days before. The case was still ongoing, with law enforcement searching for Cyril who managed to evade capture. As days turned into weeks, the memory of that eerie night lingered with me. I felt thankful for my quick decision to flee and call for help when I did. It was harrowing to fathom how Cyril had possibly hurt or even killed others in such grotesque ways and that I had been completely unaware as a mere bystander. With Cyril still on the loose, an unshakable uneasiness remained in the air. His reign of terror was far from over, leaving one to wonder when and where he would strike next. But for now, all I could do was keep myself alert and aware while carrying on with life. As I continued my trucking job down endless highways and past sides of roads where other strangers stood, a part of me couldn't help but watch a bit more cautiously than before. I knew that sometimes, the seemingly kind gesture of helping another could bring danger closer than intended. While it's safe to say I learned my lesson, my thoughts often drifted back to those who became entangled in Cyril's twisted web, left as gruesome reminders of the sheer unpredictability of life. And with each passing route taken and restless nights spent in my truck's cab, I couldn't shake the feeling that Cyril would surface again. But the question remained, how many more victims would cross paths with him before he was caught? Being a truck driver isn't all it's cracked up to be. Sure, you get to travel all around the United States, seeing new places every day. But the hours are long, you're away from your loved ones for extended periods of time, and sometimes the things you experience live with you forever. This is one of those stories. I'm driving my usual route through Tennessee on a Friday evening. The weather calls for rain as the clouds begin to gather and darken, but it hasn't started yet. I've been on the road for about 12 hours now, stopping only for food, gas, and the occasional restroom break. As I pull into a small rest area off the highway to stretch my legs and grab a snack from one of the vending machines, I notice a man lingering near an old pickup truck in the parking lot. Something about this guy gives me chills. He's tall, lean, and has unkempt dark hair that hangs down over his eyes, which intensely scan the area. His clothes are dirty and stained. He seems agitated, shifting his weight from one foot to another. Deciding not to engage with him, I quickly go inside the rest area building. In there... I overhear some folks saying quite a few truckers have had strange encounters in this area recently. People going missing or tragic occurrences happening abruptly without explanation. Fueling my growing uneasiness, I leave the building and head back to my truck. As I'm backing out of my parking spot, 
I notice that another man has disappeared from sight. Despite feeling worried, I shake off those thoughts, convince myself it's just a coincidence, and continue driving. The rain finally starts pouring down as night falls. Visibility gets worse with every passing moment because of heavy rainfall pelting against my windshield. Driving cautiously, I try not to let my imagination run wild, especially after hearing those troubling stories earlier. But deep inside, I can't help but feel scared. Somewhere along the highway, I see flashing lights through the storm. I slow down to pull over, thinking I'm being pulled over by a cop. Instead, I find an overturned car with a woman trapped inside and screaming for help. The rain is relentless as I rush out of my truck, grabbing a crowbar from the back. As I pry open the door to help her escape, suddenly that creepy guy from the rest area appears out of nowhere. He immediately starts shouting at me to step aside so that he can help. Something inside tells me not to trust him, as there's something off about his demeanor. Ignoring him, I finally manage to free the woman and carry her over to my truck. Delirious and injured, she stammers something about an accident caused by a deer in the road but claims she doesn't remember much. The creepy man continues pacing around us, still attempting to assist. My suspicions regarding him are only growing stronger at this point. Now safe inside my truck, the woman is shivering uncontrollably while muttering to herself. She believes that someone or something has been following her ever since she left Memphis, and more disturbingly, she thinks it might be connected to those stories about mysterious disappearances we've both heard. We realize we're not alone in noticing the peculiar behavior of this man from earlier, as we catch sight of him outside, hiding behind some trees near the crashed car. This unsettling realization has our hearts pounding in our chests while adrenaline races through our veins, making decisions even more difficult. With the woman safely in my truck and the unsettling man trying to get close, I turned to her and said, I'm going to call for help. Do you have a phone I can use? She appeared disoriented and unable to process my request. Recognizing that calling for help was vital, I quickly grabbed my radio and attempted to contact anyone nearby who could hear our distress call. Unbeknownst to us, that creepy guy had been stalking us this whole time watching from a distance, never straying too far from his truck. He had unnaturally sharp teeth, and his eyes glowed with a sinister hue in the darkness of the night. Our desperation seemed only to fuel his twisted motivation. As we waited for help to come, I continued talking with the woman about her ordeal being followed and feeling like prey to this monstrous being who now stood uncomfortably close to us. The periodic flashes of lightning revealed extensive mutilations on his body, clear signs that he was no ordinary human. The horrifying realization that he inflicted these wounds upon himself before moving on to others instinctively put us on high alert. His intentions were becoming clearer, as we observed him repeatedly trying to interfere with our efforts to call for help. We knew he was involved in those local stories of people going missing or experiencing tragic ends. Given our precarious situation, I knew that I had to do something drastic. Being unarmed and unfamiliar with this place, escape seemed almost impossible. Nevertheless, I took the woman's hand and stepped out of my truck. As we approached the overturned car wreckage, hoping to find anything that could serve as a makeshift weapon against our antagonist, his spine-chilling laughter echoed through the night air. He lunged toward us with shocking speed. I mustered all my strength and swung a piece of twisted metal at him, 
that I had grabbed from the wreckage. He recoiled briefly in pain but quickly regained his composure. The impact had only slowed him down for a moment. Thankfully, due to our radio call earlier, sirens became audible in the distance. I presumed that help was finally on its way, but I knew we couldn't wait any longer. We ran back to my truck, and I revved the engine, my mind racing for a plan to protect ourselves and escape this nightmare. Keeping the headlights off to avoid detection, I sped out of the rest area. We didn't know how long or how far we had been driving, but not even a minute after leaving the rest area, we came across another truck driver who had stopped by the highway to assist us in response to our call. We quickly filled him in on what had just transpired, and he revealed that he recognized our relentless tormentor. The man's name was Silas Blackwood, a long-dead serial killer rumored to haunt these roads as an unholy revenant. He targeted truckers and travelers alike, mutilating them in unspeakable ways before moving on to the next victim. His name would send shivers down anyone's spine, especially those whose paths crossed his on moonlit nights. Our new ally vowed to offer assistance by driving ahead to the nearest police station while we stayed within sight. The unnerving thing about Silas, though, was his ability never to be caught or killed. Witnesses were left traumatized but alive. However, they didn't know what he wanted or how he could live like this. Driving behind the other trucker's vehicle and trying to keep our wits amid the panic spurred adrenaline filled miles of driving through winding roads wrapped in darkness. Ultimately, after arriving at a safer location and alerting local authorities about Silas' latest activities, we became yet another couple of survivors with haunting memories we'd rather leave behind. The story of Silas Blackwood will send chills down anyone's spine who has the misfortune of hearing it. Who knows what really drives him, or why he has chosen to pursue an existence so violent and inhuman. What we do know is that no one who crosses his path will be left untouched by terror and those who survive will make every effort to never venture into that area of Tennessee again. I've been a truck driver for almost two decades, and let me tell you, I've seen some strange things on the road. Of course, when you're covering as many miles as I do, it's inevitable. But there's one experience that I've never been able to shake, something that I can't help but revisit from time to time. This happened a while back, during a frigid winter when the icy roads made my life especially difficult. It was another long haul through the United States, and I just crossed into Illinois when I decided to make a stop and grab dinner at a roadside diner. As I sat down to my meal of greasy bacon and runny eggs, I noticed a man sitting alone in the corner booth. He was tall and lanky, wearing a dingy old baseball hat that hung low over his eyes. Now, I didn't think much of him at first. After all, this diner wasn't exactly the pinnacle of fine dining. But something about him gave me an uneasy feeling. He stared at his plate without touching his food, seemingly oblivious to the world around him. Eventually, he caught me looking at him. Our eyes locked for an uncomfortable moment before he looked away, a sinister grin creeping across his face. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. It might have been nothing, but my gut told me there was something off about this guy. I quickly finished my meal and left the diner. The chill of the night air hit me hard as I went back to my truck. As soon as I climbed into my rig and started it up, I noticed headlights flickering on behind me. This guy from the diner had followed me out into the parking lot. 
I began driving down the highway with just one purpose, to shake this creep off my tail. But no matter how incrementally faster I pushed on the gas pedal or made sudden lane changes, he stayed glued to my bumper. I finally spotted an all-night rest stop, buzzing with activity from fellow truckers, and believed it would surely be a good time to lose him. I pulled in, thinking that he wouldn't follow me there, but I was wrong. His car rolled in right after mine, sleazily sliding into a parking space. As I got out of my truck and made my way toward the well-lit restroom area, I noticed him following me at a distance. To test my sanity, I double-backed and watched as he panicked and tried to act casual by leaning against his car. Determined to confront him, I stormed over to him with an angry scowl on my face. As soon as he saw me coming, his casual demeanor vanished. He slammed his car door and sped off like a bat out of hell. With my adrenaline pumping and the overwhelming feeling of dread lingering, I returned to the safety of my truck. That night, I couldn't sleep. All I could think about was the man in the baseball hat and what his intentions were. Early morning light streamed through my windshield as other truckers geared up for another long day on the road. My shift would soon continue as well, but as unsettling as it may be, I found myself searching each vehicle for the one that belonged to that sinister man from last night. True to my truck driver instincts, I kept a close watch on the cars passing by as I continued down the highway. I couldn't shake the feeling that this man would appear again, and once more, I found myself anxiously scanning each vehicle for any sign of his presence. My head was on a swivel, but I knew that focusing solely on him would put me and others at risk. It was during a quick pit stop at a gas station a couple of days later that I overheard two local policemen discussing recent unsolved murders in the area. That's when things started falling into place. The victims, often solo travelers or truckers, were mutilated in particularly grotesque ways, their bodies left to be discovered on the side of the road. A waitress at the gas station further mentioned that a mysterious man, fitting the description of my mysterious pursuer, had been spotted around locations where the victims were believed to have vanished. With a tightening knot in my stomach, I realized that this man wasn't just unsettling, he was downright dangerous. Though I considered calling the police to report my suspicions, I hesitated. After all, what evidence could I provide them with? They needed something concrete to arrest this maniac, and simply recounting an unnerving experience wouldn't cut it. With an apprehensive determination fueling me, I resolved to gather irrefutable evidence against this malevolent stranger before alerting law enforcement. To do this, though risky and dangerous, I decided to let the man catch up to me again and follow him from there. As if sensing my newfound resolve, my pursuer reappeared on my path just a day later. This time, however, instead of trying to lose him on the roads like before, I strategically altered my driving speed and allowed him to catch up ever so slowly. Eventually, we both pulled off onto a desolate stretch of road. The man stepped out of his car, unaware that I was closely observing his actions. Retrieving something from his trunk, he disappeared into the woods nearby. Judging that this would likely be my best chance to gather evidence, I cautiously exited my truck and followed him from a distance, my phone ready to document anything incriminating. After a nerve-wracking few minutes of maneuvering through the underbrush, I arrived at a grisly scene. A horrifically dismembered body lay before my pursuer as he glanced around before kneeling down to further defile the remains. As revolting as it was to witness this sinister act, 
I knew I had to capture it on video to provide the authorities with indisputable evidence. With trembling hands, I put my phone on record and silently filmed the carnage as Bao rose to the back of my throat. Once I was sure I had enough footage, I retraced my steps back to my truck, still shell-shocked by what I had just witnessed. I contacted local law enforcement immediately after reaching safety and divulged everything, from my first encounter with the man in the diner to the gruesome sight in the woods. His arrest soon followed, and detectives later interrogated me for hours. They revealed during this time that his name was Edgar Milton. While recalling this harrowing encounter still sends a shiver down my spine even today, it also serves as a chilling reminder that danger can lurk anywhere, sometimes hiding in plain sight. As for myself, life moved on, but not without keeping in mind that some roads are darker than they seem and vigilance will forever be necessary on any journey ahead. In 1997, I had been working as a truck driver for just over a decade. I loved cruising down the open road and listening to classic rock on the radio, just relishing in the solitude of it all. Most of my friends were envious that I was paid to travel and explore various parts of the United States. At first glance, it seemed like an ideal job for a guy like me who never cared for cubicles and routine. But like any job, it wasn't without its perils. I had until now managed to maintain my blissful ignorance of any potentially hazardous situations. In fact, I boasted about how skilled I was at evading trouble in my line of work, but this time life had other plans. It had been a sweltering hot summer day when I was pulled off at one of those 24-hour diners near Nashville, Tennessee. Dinner time was long over, and the only interactions inside were between weary long-haul truck drivers like myself and equally exhausted waitresses. As soon as I sank into the booth with my burger and cold root beer, my attention was drawn to an individual walking into the diner from another door. He appeared haggard and unkempt, with clothes that hung too loose on his rail-thin frame. His hair was greasy and unevenly chopped, giving him a disheveled appearance. Underneath the filth, his eyes pierced through, cold, calculating blue eyes that seemed out of place on such an otherwise unremarkable person. For reasons beyond my understanding, his gaze seemed fixated on me. Ignoring my intuition's insistence to leave as soon as possible, I decided to finish my meal quickly and then head back onto the open road where I felt safest. As I stood at the cash register, paying my bill, I glanced out the window toward my truck. The unkempt man from earlier was standing beside it in conversation with two other rough-looking characters. Assuming they were just taking shelter from the blistering sun, I refused to entertain any dark suspicions. Once outside, I tried to amble unnoticed toward the truck as if nothing was amiss. As I got about a few yards away, I realized my truck was flanked by two other vehicles that hadn't been there when I arrived. With so little traffic in this diner at this hour, it could only seem suspicious in my eyes. The unkempt man's eyes met mine again, a sinister grin spreading across his face almost unnaturally wide. Without a word, the two men who were accompanying him approached me. They reeked of an unidentifiable burn smell, and their hands were stained with something dark and viscous. Hey, one of them said in a gravelly voice that sent chills down my spine. You look like you know your way around these roads. His companion leaned in even closer and whispered with hot breath on my face. Maybe you can help us out. 
We're looking for something around here. At that moment, instinct took over, and knowing that I couldn't outrun all three men on foot, I decided to bluff my way out of the situation. Steadying myself against a surge of anxiety like nothing I'd ever experienced before, I replied casually. Well, fellas, it's been fun, but I really should be getting back on the road. You know how deadlines and all that work. Then I tried to push past them without having to touch any part of their grimy forms. Unfortunately, before I could reach the door of my truck cab, they had formed a solid wall between it and me while still wearing those disturbingly unsettling grins. It became clear that simply talking my way out of this situation was not going to be enough. Suddenly and without warning, one of them lunged at me. With surprising agility, I dodged his grasp, only to realize that he had sliced open my left arm in the process. Blood gushed out and my adrenaline spiked, causing everything else around me to blur except for those three threatening figures. Fighting the searing pain in my arm, I realized I needed to act quickly and decisively. Glancing around, I noticed several tire irons lying on the ground near a parked motorcycle. With lightning speed, I grabbed one and swung it at the assailant closest to me, connecting with the side of his head. The blow sent him sprawled on the ground. Surprised but still determined, the other two men charged at me. I managed to sidestep one, pushing him off balance into a stack of crates beside the diner. The third man, however, caught me off guard, landing a heavy punch to my face. My vision blurred for a moment as blood streamed from my nose. Unable to call for help for fear of attracting more unwanted attention, I was forced to defend myself using only instinct and quick reflexes. Gritting my teeth with determination, I fought back with everything I had. I swung the tire iron again in self-defense, aiming for the ringleader's knees this time. He crumpled in pain, not expecting such vicious retaliation. Now free from their grasp, I raced back to my truck cab and locked myself inside just as the remaining henchmen tried to break through. Fumbling with my cell phone, a daunting task given my injured arm, I dialed 911 and reported what had happened. As soon as flashing lights appeared on the scene about ten minutes later, it was clear that the situation was far more complicated than a mere trio of thugs. The police gathered evidence and questioned witnesses while securing the area where these events had transpired outside this Nashville diner. While receiving medical treatment for my injury and recounting what happened to law enforcement, an officer shared unsettling information that put everything into context. I don't know if you've heard, he said somberly while checking his notes, but there have been multiple attacks over here in the last few weeks. One thing in common at every crime scene is the description of the leader. It matches that man right over there. He pointed to the unkempt man being led away in handcuffs, still grinning like a maniac. That's Marcus Shelby, a well-known felon notorious for mindlessly brutal and inexplicable acts of violence. The officer continued. We thought he was out of the state, but it seems like he's been hiding out locally. The knowledge of Shelby's identity sent a jolt through my system. His deadly reputation preceded him and shook me to my core. Unsettled by the close call, I decided I couldn't bear to stay in Nashville any longer. That night, I drove as far away as possible from that seemingly cursed diner, haunted by the thought of what could have happened if I hadn't managed to escape. In time... I heard news reports documenting Marcus Shelby's capture, providing a taste of cold comfort. However, that hard-fought battle took its toll on me. 
nightmares plagued my rest for days to come. The memories imprinted within my mind would always serve as a chilling reminder that danger could be lurking during any stop at an otherwise innocuous roadside establishment. Although I never fully understood his motivations or how many lives he had destroyed in his path, what remained clear was that something deeply sinister and unsettling had been interrupted when our paths crossed. The haunting image of his cold blue eyes pierced into me whenever the memory threatened to resurface, casting a permanent damper on my previously cherished life as a lone truck driver traveling those vast American highways.